Oh, you know what I love? Sports. I love sports. Sports, 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 sports. When it comes to Texas A&M. Where are you getting this information? <laughs> Let me tell you. Welcome to Texas. I need to talk a little sports with you, Ags. David Nunez here with Texags Radio. Billy Lucci here on Texags Radio. Olin Buchanan. We will develop men. We will graduate players. And we will win championships on the field. The best way for us to win is to do it together. Do you realize everybody knows who you are right now? I think we're coming into this year with a new confidence. Schools are like, we're freaking Texas A&M, man. Like... That's about as pretty a throw-catch combo as there is. I saw the safety roll, the slot fade. I knew where I needed to put the ball. You had <laughs> no other option but one hand at that yeah, point. Yeah, man, 50-50 right? ball, I got to come down with You know, if I'm betting on anybody, it's the Aggies. Hey, good morning, Bryan College Station. Welcome to the Thursday edition of Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. I'm Ryan Broninger. I welcome in the dozens, or maybe even less than that, of B-team members who are the growing fan base of the second string host in this radio chair. Uh, David is gone for today and tomorrow, and then next week I'll also be hosting on Thursday and Friday. But I am sitting in the lovely Rollo Insurance Studios with... The well, lovelier... Callie Garner. She, in the Angry Elephant she, News and Social Center. pretty lovely with that, uh, with that Texas Rangers defending world champion Texas Rangers. It is opening on. day. and it I would like day. Yes, and I would like to say happy opening day to all those who celebrate, all the baseball fans out there listening to us. Uh, and it is right. It, Olin, you were telling us before the show started, you th- never thought you'd live to see the day where it would be opening day for the defending world champion Texas Rangers and – so, uh, I raise a cold cup of coffee to all the Rangers fans out there. Congratulations again on your world championship. You guys were better than the Houston Astros for a month. Right month? That's the right month. And that's all that matters, right? That's all that matters. Meanwhile, down in Houston today, the Astros will open up their 2024 campaign as the reigning AL West champions and uh, looking to keep the window open. And when you are a... When you're not spending $1.13 billion on your roster like a favorite team of one of the Texags employees to, that runs around here, uh, you know, you have to really take would that, in would that these. Be Richard win- Zane? Uh, I'm not, I didn't say anybody's name. But okay. yes, Richard Zane. Because they the spent all Angeles, money on the big Japanese guy. Well, they've spent a lot of, they, they signed two Japanese guys. But the big Japanese guy got all got the most of the money. And you can bet on that. You can bet on it. I would wager <laughs> that. <laughs> and uh, so, when but when you're not a fan of one of those teams that's going to spend extravagantly, then you have to celebrate and be excited whenever you have these windows of opportunity to win championships. And if you go back to, I guess it's like a decade long run, just about for the Astros. I'd never thought I'd see this. So I'm very much soaking in this. By the way, to my left, and that velvety, yummy East Texas accent you hear, is our columnist and Heisman Trophy voter, Mr. Olin Buchanan. Heck Olin. yeah. It's the go hour, presented by CC Creations. Can you turn your phone off, yeah, amateur? I who's, who's... Somebody's texting you. Oh, I it bet is you're Richard tr- Zane. Oh, it says, is. Oh. Are the Astros poor? Oh, man. He's already, <coughs> already got him. His feelings are already hurt this morning. Uh, this is the go hour. They've been the warehouse. Some money, by the way, the Astros. They have, um, but not. I mean, one point one three billion. What are we doing here? Trying to buy a championship. That's a franchise that has said we're tired of being embarrassed in the divisional round. So we will go do whatever we can financially to make sure that never happens again. If you want to look around the world of sport, there have been some other organizations, probably not within your realm of purview. But I'm talking about like Manchester City, Real Madrid, these big soccer clubs that say, we're just going to go buy a championship. And to their credit, it has worked for both of those clubs. And that is a shot, a, not a so, so not a veiled shot at David Nuno's favorite soccer team. I wouldn't team. have known that. I'm not really into European kickball. Yeah. Well, you're not – Yeah, it, it's, it's a – I don't know, Owen. I don't want to throw the entire part of the state of Texas where you're from under the bus, so I'll leave that alone. It's uh, the go hour presented by where, the warehouse at CC Creations. Maroon never looked 
as good as it does at the warehouse at CC Creations. And this is Coffee Talk presented by Texax Coffee. And I have these ad reads and I've already lost them. So, David, if you're listening, I apologize if I'm costing you any money. Uh, here we go. I found them. It's the Go Hour presented by the Warehouse of Group. Maroon never looks so good as it does with Maroon U. Coffee Talk presented by Texax Coffee. Beat the hell out of the morning by going to texax.com slash coffee. We've got a big show today, a big show the next two days. Lots of guests. Olin, obviously, uh, here with us in the 8 o'clock hour, as always. And then Stephen McGee will join us at the bottom of the hour. In the 9 o'clock hour, we have Texas a head baseball coach Jim Schlossnagel with the Aggies getting prepared to host the Auburn Tigers starting tonight in a pre-Easter Thursday, Friday, Saturday series. So we'll talk to the head man there about the expectations for the weekend. Uh, at 9.15, Troy Clonch, the original number 12, joins us uh, to talk about his journey with opening day happening today, but his journey uh, through the minor leagues and then get his thoughts on this current Aggie baseball team. At 10 o'clock, we've got Logan Lee coming in for a segment. I, I, I think we're missing – oh, I'm missing Aaron Torres – at 9.35. So we're going to hit everything. We're going to hit spring football. We're going to hit, obviously, baseball. We'll get Logan's thought as he wraps up uh, the basketball season for us and look ahead at the Sweet 16 there with Aaron Torres. OB, uh, this is an interesting time of year for you because uh, you are kind of open to ideas for columns and articles. Obviously, spring football will take away a lot of your attention. But this little kind of lull between (laughs) basketball and – spring football really getting into the thick of things uh, you're looking for for articles and always and one of i think the storylines perhaps we can do an on-air meeting about content here <laughs> okay but one of the things i have written down to to discuss with you is as a columnist i think you have a really unique perspective on press conferences right you go to them all all the time for multiple sports and you interact with these coaches and you're the guy that's on the other end of the microphone where these sound bites come out of, you have gotten to go to probably what, four Mike Elko press conferences so far. I haven't been to a lot. Yeah. But your initial impressions of him from your perspective as a columnist in the way he answers your questions, are you satisfied with his answers? Uh, Do you feel like he he does a good job of being open and honest? Do you feel like his answers are well-rounded and gives you, uh, enough content, uh, enough to go on to, to yeah. write your, your pieces? Yeah, I think he gives you a, uh, a direct answer to a direct question, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, what else can you ask for? I asked him yesterday, and some people might think this is a duh question, right? But you still got to get it on the record. And I just said, hey, um, in spring football, how – is there a point when you get an idea – who your starters might be might be at a position, or is that something that you just never know until August? And he tells you, hey, by the end of spring, you know, you want to have a good, you know, you figure out who's your like offensive line eight top eight to ten, and then you start getting some separation. So, yeah, you have a you you get an idea of where you're going to build from that, and then you know, come August, there's still competition, but at least you have a starting point. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the reason how come I was asking that is because we all hear about how you have, you know, one of the greatest assets for a successful offensive line is this cohesiveness and working together and familiarity with each other, right? And yet they have an offensive line right now with so many new guys they are mixing and matching and trying to figure out um, who's their best five and where's the best place for them. And um, you're only three – Game, uh, three practices in and just one in pads. But so how long do you have to mix and match? And when do you start getting an idea of what you're looking for? Behind the glass in the fishbowl today, pulling the strings is Nick Savage. And Nick, the reason I'm bringing in Nick now is he was cutting some clips of the Elko press conference yesterday. And Nick brought up a really good point. How he starts some of these pressers by – acknowledging the other sports on campus. I thought that was pretty classy. I, I think that's classy. I got that very, clip if y'all want to hear it. Right yeah, go now. ahead. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, here it is. 
Yeah, uh, first of all, just uh, good luck to Coach Holmes, our men's and women's, our men's uh, swimming and diving team going off to the NCAA championships this weekend. Um, good luck to Coach McKay uh, as our equestrian or women's equestrian team hosts the SEC here this weekend. Um, so a lot of good things going on within Texas A&M athletics uh, this spring. And uh, obviously, if you see the success our baseball uh, and softball teams are having right now, uh, certainly setting the bar high for us and what we have to do this fall. So that's Mike Elko, his opening statement in yesterday's press conference. And look, I, that may happen at a lot of schools across the country. It's not been happening here uh, from the head football coach. And I'm not saying that's a necessity or um, that is a, uh, a personality trait or a decision he's got, he has to make. But he went out of his way to acknowledge the success across multiple sports. And I, I, that might be a Mike Elko thing. It also might be a Trev Alberts thing. And we've heard a lot of things about uh, – Trev Alberts being a wanting a cohesive working unit as an athletic department, even amongst the coaches. So I, I had the feeling that was a Mike Elko thing even before too. Trev Alberts too. was the coach because he'd made some references before and he showed up at at other sports. Mm-hmm. Um, I just thought it was a real classic thing to say. He, he's and been I like multiple said, baseball games. And I like when he said, and it you know you know shows the standard. Basically, I'm paraphrasing that mm-hmm. that we have to live up to because f- quite frankly. Most sports uh, this year have been pretty successful. Yeah, that's a good observation. I haven't sat down here and thought about it, so I'm just You know, volleyball it. got into the NCAA tournament, went from having to change coaches to, get, coaches to getting in mm-hmm. the NCAA tournament. I like Jamie Morrison. I think he's pretty yeah. sharp. You know, men's basketball came tantalizingly close to getting to the Sweet 16. Huge but got improvement this, for Joni Taylor. They, you know, and baseball and softball are, are going great. Uh Track seems track, to be track is always well. good. Yeah. The uh, golf, uh, tennis, the golf, yeah. The, it, so it, almost it, everybody's having the equestrian is uh, they're uh, they got some stud horses over there. Can't forget softball. Trisha Ford is. I, I don't think I did rolling. Oh, sorry. Jeez, <laughs> jeez, Owen. <laughs> Just said baseball. Go ahead, softball. Nick. Go ahead, Nick. Finish your thought. <laughs> well. <laughs> I swear, <laughs> he did just say it, but Nick, I wasn't oh, okay. going to cut you off. I didn't. I didn't. I'm, that's my fault. He's I working pay, back there. I'm he doing can't listen to every word once. that comes. I'm, I'm sorry, Obi. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, listen. Anybody that's walking around this planet Earth, and God bless Irma, because she's kind of forced to. No, any, she was with me by choice. But well, at this point though, she's kind of forced to listen to you. But anybody that has to listen to every word that comes out of your mouth. That's a oh, I never, Whoever said that Irma listens to every word that comes out of my mouth? <laughs> she may hear it, but she don't listen to uh, it, right? There's a difference, right? Yeah, it's like she has this force field around her ears, and it only <laughs> works when she wants it to. Well, I could use some of those marital <laughs> tips. Maybe we'll talk about that in the commercial break. Uh, but I do think that was you – know, it's a good observation by you, but I also think it is an Elko thing. Yeah. I think he's just savvy and aware of everything going on about him, and, and – or around him, and that was kind of the purpose of my first question to you was, you know, it's less to me right now. It's less about what he says for you, for you and the guys on the beat, and more about how he says it and how he interacts and the thoughtfulness of his answers. And it doesn't seem like he's blowing anybody off. He's letting you guys get your entire question out, and then he's responding to it. It, it seems to be just a very cognizant awareness of what he's saying to the media and also but but not trying to pull any punches with his responses and look we're analyzing a month or two whatever of press conferences but this is just early impressions well he seems to me and yeah things can change but he seems to me like a uh an honest stand-up guy that's gonna within reason no coach is gonna tell you everything that's going on but within reason is answering your questions as directly as possible now that said, let's let's say this. There was a time when I thought Jimbo Fisher was uh, was great in terms of answering your questions. He'd do it real fast. Sometimes he would anticipate your question, how it was going to finish, and just jump out. And but and I think I thought the first three years he was very open and uh, cooperative is probably not the right word because. But you know when 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 it turned to criticism, then he became much more guarded. And, and I even think 
was sure. not telling the truth all the time. And, and I think Mike Elko would tell you that, yeah, everything is kind of hunky dory and there everything's good because he hasn't coached a game right. yet and he hasn't lost a game yet. And that's when the criticisms come. But look, maybe I, he won't, and there will never the criticisms will never come. Well, that would be. I mean, I once said, I never thought I'd say defending world champion, world series champion, Texas Rangers. So maybe if that can happen, to say, hey, defending national champion Texas A and M Aggies is not out of the realm of possibility. If it could happen to the Rangers, it could happen for anybody. And we were talking before the show started about what it would be like to be a Georgia football fan right now. Yeah. You have to realize you're living in your salad days right now. <coughs> yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And George, like you go to the – you're going to every Saturday with a feeling like we're going to win the game, and it probably won't be close. Like when's the last time an Aggie football fan felt that way? And it's gotten, they've gotten so callous to the opposite end of that, that a lot of times this fan base, I feel like, can't enjoy the moment, regardless of sport, because they're a little bit jaded to the I, other shoe always. Yeah, it's always dropping. dropping. Yeah. I kind of felt like that in 2020. But it took a while, right? Well, it took the, the, the floor to win. Right? And, and then that's after that, they changed, got on a yeah. roll. But before that, you know, I think we all remember in, in, in uh, 2012, after probably after the Arkansas game, you kind of expected them to win. But Even when they lost to LSU, you're like, how did that happen? It's one, the problem, I think, for A&M fans is it's been one every, once every – Every five or six years. Seven right? years, yeah. yeah. And it, but still, I, I, I'm with – and Billy is a big proponent of this. Like, you have to look at what's happening in the moment, not what happened in the past. Yep. Uh, and you should be able to be happy for a Buzz Williams team that rallied late and got into the tournament and won a game and took Houston to the ropes. But you don't always have to go back to, well, they shouldn't have lost five in a row. Right. You're exactly right. They shouldn't have lost five in a row. They may have put themselves in a position where they weren't playing U of H in round two right. had they not done that. But that shouldn't take away from what the happiness you, you can feel when they win, what was it, four oh, or five straight, absolutely. and they go to the tournament and they play so well in round one. <laughs> like, enjoy the moments, man. Like, mm -hmm. you, sure. you don't get them back. Third year in a row that they were playing their best basketball at the end of the season, and the only thing that I came away feeling negative about from that basketball game is I think A&M lost it more than Houston won it because of their free throw yeah. shooting. Yeah. And I think we all, everybody that watched that game that wanted A&M to win or just wanted to see a good basketball game was highly frustrated with the free throw shooting in the first half and feeling like you're, you're uh, wasting opportunity. Mm -hmm. And yet they stormed back and Anderson Garcia would set that great shot. And all that is, yeah, it was amazing in the moment, but I think most people will come back and say, but what if you didn't miss all those free throws in the first half? If you make three more, what yeah. does it do to yeah. the outcome of the game? Yeah. All right, so like I said, we were going to get to a lot of stuff. I didn't have any basketball talk on the docket here in the first hour, but we'll it's get back on happened the, organically. That's right. We're going to get back on the football train. Uh, when we come back, we got more to talk about from the uh, press conferences yesterday, Tori and York. Trey Zoon, what does a healthy Trey Zoon mean for not only this offensive line, for, but for this offense going forward? Also, Josh Pate continues to tease the spring portal madness. We'll talk about that and a lot more. You're listening to Tex Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
Great song choice. Is that keep, your story and you're sticking to it? Keep the uh, 90s country theme the rest of the day. How about that? If you're listening back in the uh, mothership, we'll take any uh, – I'll take any Mark Chestnut, Clay Walker, Tracy Bird. Yeah, this is Colin Ray. I'll take – I like Tracy Bird. Some Doug Supernall. Tracy Bird's uh, – Couldn't roll me a seven if you gave me loaded dice, OB. Tracy Bird's kid came to school at A&M, right? He did. Yeah, because yeah. didn't Tracy come out to one of our tailgates and – was before playing. a baseball game, I think, wasn't it? Or it was maybe a spring football game? No, I thought it was a regular season football oh, game. And he got told he started that, playing music, and the cops came over and said, "You can't play music." What? Somebody, I think, somebody complained that he was playing a little too loud. It's Tracy Bird, man. And in the afternoon, I don't know. Some people, sometimes yeah. people just want to keep Fun you suckers. from having a. If you drink, don't drive. What do you do? Um, if you drink, drink, don't drive. Do the watermelon crawl. Do the watermelon crawl. Tracy Bird, good Beaumont boy. Is that right? That's He's right. Beaumont yeah. guy. So, it's, I mean, all the guys I listed there on yeah. my suggested. Clay intros, Walker Clay, was hit on my wife. Yeah. Well, yeah. We, that'll be an in-between break conversation um, because I, well, whatever. We'll leave that alone. But Tracy Bird, Mark Chestnut, Clay Walker, all Beaumont boys. I love them from Beaumont. I grew yeah. up listening to those guys. Yeah, one of those Beaumont boys better watch his step. But we ain't scared of East Texas people. We're you're not. Be, you're beneath us. Geographically Just geographically. and literally. <laughs> Just <laughs> geographically. Don't, don't be hitting on my wife now. <laughs> Ryan Broniger and Olin Buchanan. to go hour presented by Warehouse at CC Creations Coffee Talk. Presented by Texax Coffee. Over there in the Angry Elephant News and Social Center is Callie Gardner. Put her to work. 979-693-1150. 979-693-1150. Callie Garner in the Angry Elephant News and Social Center with her Texas Rangers gear on. And we found out during the break that she is a house divided. She has one member of her family, at least, that's got some sense. I, yes, <laughs> that's me. No. Uh, good, um, good retort. My, my brother's an Astros fan. My dad roots for both. He likes the Texas teams. My sister could not care less. Uh, kind of jumped on the Rangers bandwagon trip this year just because she wanted to Joined in on the family drama, um, but she really she wanted to support care. a winner. Yeah, she did, and she got to. A champion, so, I so good say. for her. Good well, for her. A World Series champion. Well, you she know, had to make that decision world. late if that's what how her processes went. <laughs> Honestly, because the Astros were the regular season divisional champ. Mm -hmm, yeah. So for six months, again, for six months, the better team you, were the Houston you, Astros. You're you gonna put that. You're gonna put that. Uh, Six months better team pin it up on your uh, do no, it. No, they'll probably put it between the two World Series pennants. <laughs> okay, well deserved World Series, and one of them you didn't have to cheat to get. You gosh. don't know that. Oh gosh, you don't know that. <laughs> I don't care. They ain't taking. That. I don't They're either. not taking that trophy away. I don't even. I don't blame you. Uh, but anyway, moving on. Moving on. But anyway, put Callie to work. Tell her. Send her multiple text that she's got to read about the greatness of the Houston Astros while wearing that Rangers jersey, mm -hmm. and we can clip it and save it forever. But <laughs> topic of the day a little bit uh, for the remainder of the hour is going to be spring football. And we talked about Mike Elko's presser yesterday, heard one clip of it. But, OB, you talked to me before the show started about how impressed you were with Torian York. Not only he's always a very bright kid yeah. and a very well-spoken kid, but also – uh, physically, you thought he looked much better. Yeah, I mean, he looks like a, what an SEC linebacker I think is supposed to look like. You can, at least I, I think you can tell that there's he's been working out the the, the Tommy Moffat influence is showing on him. I mean, he looked good physically. You know, he really played well last year, mm -hmm. and I think you're seeing a guy at growth with the physical growth, and I think you, you know, I'm, I'm anticipating. Even more mental growth as uh, I think you're typically better in your second year as a starter than you are in your first. And I think now you will have to learn a new scheme. Yeah, I think that. Um, but having the the experience of having already started a year in the SEC, season, yeah. I think Torin York is the kind of guy you can th that can be the foundation for the culture you're trying to build because not only is he a good player, but you know he was saying yesterday, this is my defense. All right. I'm going to lead this thing. And I think you always – your leader has to be a um, a productive guy. You can't be a terrible player but a good talker, right? Because then they're going to say, hey, shut up and, you know, go do this. Mm -hmm. I remember one time we had a host here that was telling me that, you know, Connor uh, was the redheaded guy that used to be – he was a uh, – he held the ball. 
McQueen. <laughs> well, he was he a leader. The but, you know, for the, for the kicker. And I'm saying, look, you can be a good talker, but if that's all you do, you can't, that guy can't lead. Because, you yeah, know, it's when, somebody's, be a when somebody's saying, hey, I'm getting beat up on the line of scrimmage all game, and you tell me I have to work harder, look, just, just hold the ball still, right? <laughs> um, so here's a guy that can really play, seems to really care about the success of the team, and is a just a, a great spokesman, and I think he's going to be not just a leader by example, but a, you know, a, wants to take on that role of, of leading this team. So um, that's the kind of guy you want as a face of your program. And not that it matters today, but when you think about the wrecking crew defenses, the leaders of those defenses were the linebackers. Well, I think usually a linebacker does – lead the way maybe yeah. a safety or yeah like i could see bryce anderson coming yeah. into that role or shamar turner or, hey have multiple ones well yeah and i'll tell you what who is you just listen to enough people talk and who's trending in the direction of potential team captain type of player is nick scorton and love if, it if that's who the kind of player and person you're bringing in out of the portal that has to be an cons- we'll have to see what his production <laughs> if production matches the potential and what he's done in the past then you, hey, it's an A-plus signing out of the portal, and you want every one of them to be like that. But there's also – there's guys on the other side of the ball that are making a pretty big influence sure. out of the portal. Amaj, Amaj Reed Adams has been one of the more yeah, highly talked uh, about He's guy. the offensive lineman out of uh, Kansas. Kansas yeah. Yes, originally out of DeSoto. So it seems like so far, and it's exactly what you expected, and when they went out and signed all those guys out of the portal, it was almost not expected. It had to happen. Like it was a necessity for this team. But we've seen and heard a lot of those names starting to come to the forefront. Yeah, and you know what? Some of them aren't going to be here. But, you know, after spring practices, because what are they bringing, like 20-plus? Yeah, I forget the total number yeah. now. But it's, it's and some much. won't be here because they're going to realize, okay, my spot on this team isn't probably what I want it to be. But hit on the guys you have to hit on. And uh, I, I'm really excited about seeing what Nick Scorton's going to be. But I'm also really excited about – haven't seen what Tory New York is and Bryce Anderson is mm-hmm. uh, and, and Shamar Turner is. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and that brief, what, that brief look I saw from uh, DJ Hicks in the pole game, man, I hope that's who he is all the time. So, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I know it's only spring football, but it's football and it makes you pretty excited about what's going to happen five months from now. And you know, with Torian, him taking the next step, everybody's going to talk about replacing Edron Cooper. And I say this all the time whenever – it's not about replacing the people. On some level it is because the influence they have on the locker room and off the field, that in those arenas you are replacing a person. But on the field you're really trying to replace production, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so if Torian York is able to take a big step he forward – his production. Right. Then whoever's playing next to him, whether it be Scooby Williams or Damian Sanford or Martrell Harris or any of these linebackers – uh, it mitigates Torian's improvement, helps you get closer to that overall production of Edron Cooper, right? So, and, and that's what you really <laughs> want to get out of that position is just the overall production. It doesn't have to replace one player. Yeah, that's true. And, and I think it's going to take several people to uh, Oh, it's going to be very hard. I mean, Edron. I think Edron has going about to be a wealthy man and, and very well-earned. Uh, right. I wish my team would put play. You know, we were talking with drafting. We were talking to Shireen earlier this week. She said, well, the Cowboys have a lot of other issues. And yeah, they do. But linebacker has been an issue for a long time. And, I think and, they have a quarterback issue. Well, they will for sure next year. So do you draft one? Well, you, you know, I try to get them ready. If it was up to me, I might, depending on who was there. But, you know, Shireen's telling me that uh, that's why they brought in Trey Lance last year. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. That was kind of a forget about it move, though. Could be, and whoever they draft this year could potentially be playing for a new head coach. <laughs> uh, hopefully, <Next> <laughs> hopefully, I, as a Cowboys fan, I hope so. I hope Edron Cooper is playing for the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, I think that's a a big area of need, and he's a great player. Well, that's you know, it's a good transition to a Dallas Cowboys backup quarterback who we've got coming on. <laughs> <laughs> the next segment, Stephen McGee joining us on the other side of the break. We'll continue our conversation about spring football. I want to get his take on some things that 
uh, we've seen out of the quarterbacks and some of the stuff we've seen in the early practices from Colin Klein and get his take on how quickly uh, these quarterbacks and receivers can get acclimated to a new system. So a lot to get to still on the football side of things. On Tech Sags Radio as we roll right along on a Thursday morning, we're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. You know, they could change that to Bronny shot the jukebox, and I think it'd work, and it probably happened. I would be honored to be in a Mark Chestnut song. Didn't Guys, have, a Southeast he, Texas legend. Some, as much Mark Chestnut as you want to play. Didn't today. he have some trouble with the bottle for a while there? Don't worry about didn't it. He, didn't he? I'm just you asking. celebrate the art, not the artist. Well, I'm just asking you, did he? I don't know. I'm not going to get into his bottle. personal. I'm not going to get his personal. Well, he became Mark. a celebrity, so that makes that opens him up for the. Mark Chestnut, if you're listening, you're a Southeast Texas <laughs> and a Texas legend. I hope you sing till you can't no more. Unlike Olin, I hope gonna, Olin never sings. Well, I, yeah. Unless I, you start gaining some weight. My, yeah. Then I get, yeah, the fatter you get, the better you sing. <laughs> you must be a hell of a singer, bro. Yeah, you're, I wish. <laughs> my dad's pretty good. He's big boy. Oh, gosh. That's my right. theory anyway. We, we got to cut this out. <laughs> McGee, is Stephen McGee on? Okay, let's go to the hotline. Morning, Welcome in, Stephen McGee. Oh, he's on the phone? Oh, he's in. there he is. Stephen, are you a good singer? I'm horrible. See, he's sing. thin. See, Owen's, scared. Owen's got this theory, and it's one of Owen's typical crazy East Texas man theories, that if you get heavy, then you can sing. 
Well, I've gotten heavy. I still can't sing, so I'm anecdotal evidence. Well, nothing's a hundred percent. Okay, but, uh, <laughs> that's true. I agree with your uh, your theory, Owen. Well, there's some actors too that started their careers heavy and they were really funny, and then they got skinny, and I felt like they were less funny. I, I agree. Yeah, with it that sucked too. the funny out of them. I'll tell you the other thing. <laughs> how about smoking cigarettes? You ever, you ever uh, thought that maybe singers that smoke cigarettes have better voices? Now, I don't know if that's always true, but some of those guys that were early in the Texas music scene, like Randy Rogers and Wade Bowen, yeah. they got that deep rasp to yeah. their voice, and I'm sure on some yeah. level it has helped them. Well, I know that uh, uh, Waylon Jennings smoked a lot. And, and, you know, Willie Nelson smokes a lot, but I don't know if that's the kind of – if that affects your vocal cords. You know what? If there is a, <laughs> anybody that works for the health department <laughs> listening to this show – Please do not take any of the things that we're saying seriously because we have just advocated for weight gain and now Stephen advocating for <laughs> smoking use. I guess if you worry about anyone taking I day. guess if you're <laughs> obese and a chain smoker, you should be like a a, a a Grammy winner. Jelly roll? Well, there you go. Yeah. Wow. The opinions shared on this radio <laughs> show do not reflect their employer. I'll say that. This is your yeah, official all stand. What genre? They what are genre now. of music are you going to sing, Owen? If you had to, uh, you had to go on stage right oh, now. Yikes! What genre would I sing? Sinatra. Yeah, yeah, probably Sinatra. Ooh. You know, because I did it my way. And doesn't he <laughs> look like? Doesn't he give you Sinatra vibes with well, his I hair? Got blue and, eyes. Oh. Yeah, charismatic. Yeah, <laughs> he's the ladies' man. <laughs> hey, Stephen, we ended last segment talking about. Jeez, I cannot. We. I don't know how to get these things on track with you and him. I'm, I'm at fault here today, too. But we ended the last segment talking about Dallas Cowboys backup quarterbacks. And so that's my way of curtailing it to you. And back on topic of spring football, last week or last time I hosted, Stephen, had you on, and I asked you about how difficult it is to learn a new scheme from a quarterback perspective. Now that yeah. we've started to see these guys take to the practice field, what what is the – what is the challenge of getting on the same page with all 11? Like, obviously, it's going to take hundreds and hundreds of reps, but how choppy and frustrating can it be in these early workouts uh, when it's just tough to get everybody on the same page? Well, I think the concepts probably are – the vast majority of concepts, like the basic installs, are going to be overlapped from previous regimes, right? And I think that's true on the NFL level, too. The terminology and the way they spit it out is different. Uh, but you know, why stick stop is still why stick stop, no matter if it's West Coast or Don Coryell's digit system. So um, there's going to be some element of familiarity, you know, understanding defenses. Cover two is cover two is cover two. You know, uh, strong dog is always going to be strong dog with, you know, three fire zone behind it. it like that's not going to change. So there is some level of experience <laughs> seeing defenses and the reps that I think that does carry over. Now, picking up the terminology is very important. And that's where it comes on the quarterback. You got to be way in front of the game and you help the other guys get lined up because there's going to be confusion um, for all 11 guys in the huddle. But I think that the first several days, it's going to be very simple stuff. Uh, you know, so I think as you progress on, you're going to look to see which quarterbacks are playing the fastest. Which ones are the most decisive? When, they're, when their back foot hits, is the ball getting out on time consistently, or is there a hesitation? And that hesitation in their feet says that there's something not quite right in their mind. The picture isn't coming. Uh, they're not seeing it on, on tempo or on time. And so uh, I think that's when you'll start to see the separation is when these quarterbacks start to play faster, they're going to separate themselves. Talking to Stephen McGee on Texas Radio, presented by David Garner's Jewelers. Stephen, uh, yesterday during the presser, one thing that Trey Zoon said that I thought got more attention than it should have, and you kind of hinted at it there in that first answer, is he said that the scheme is pretty similar to what they had been running. Is 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 that just more evidence that like scheme and that word maybe a little bit overrated in terms of its meaning in today's college football and today's football in general? Yeah, I mean, I, we say this all the time, and, and people used to frown upon Jason Garrett's offense, and I'm sure there's a guy right there with you that's going to laugh about this comment, but his offense had a 70% overlap with Gary Kubiak, and I thought Gary Kubiak was one of the best play callers. The difference is between a really, really productive offense, in my opinion, besides the Jimmys and Joes, you got to have the guys out in the field that can make plays, but you take that away, all things being equal, it's when you call those plays that matter so much, and I felt like he had a great feel 
you know, when you watch Tate, his ability to get his guys open um, and force the defense's hands. He knew if he got in a certain personnel set that, and he moved to a certain formation that he was going to dictate the coverage the defense was going to play. And that allowed him to call the exact route for that defense and to get, you know, Andre Johnson or whoever it was wide open. So the timing of those plays matters so much, right? And when you call them, I think the other thing is tempo, right? I felt like that was something that we lacked under Jimbo Fisher that I would look forward to calling Klein system. And so, uh, yeah, the, the, the zone run scheme is zone run scheme. You're going to block it up very similar. There's going to be different words that the O-line coach is going to use to say, you know, it's a swoop, a swoop block here. Okay, great. You know, you may call it a double. I don't know. So point is to say that there's not everything is new when you go out on a football field. That's for sure. Well, how long, if you were ever in that position, did it ever take you to, uh, like if a coach was, maybe you didn't have a new coach. I can't remember your situation. I thought you were always a friend. But um, if the coach wants to add something to it, how long does it take you to, a, a, a good quarterback to get a grasp of what, uh, you know, of changes in, or it, it, uh, of scheme and things like that? Yeah, so I think that there's the chalkboard part of it, right? So my senior year, we actually went to Sherman. And so it was a completely makeover for me. Like I was learning a whole new brand of football and went from, you know, the under underneath the center option base, you know, offense with, with Fran. And then I moved to um, Sherman's West Coast system, right? And so it was very wordy, especially year one, until he kind of pared that down to make it more simple for the college game. Uh, but you're learning about timing and, you know, route splits and they call defenses differently. But, uh, you know, for me, I was obsessed with football. And so my learning curve was much smaller than I think other guys that are more distracted. Uh, so it really depends on the person. I feel like, you know, and it's on the chalkboard, but then I think everyone learns differently under fire and it just takes a lot of reps. For me, I was a rep guy. I just needed a lot of reps for it to feel natural to where I wasn't thinking on the football field. So, um, you know, I think it's a twofold question. I think being able to line up pre-snap and know what you're doing pre-snap is one thing, but then when the lights come on and the bullets start flying, I think it's another thing to be able to react and play fast in the system. One thing that Mike Elko has done, Stephen, and I think it's pretty intriguing, is that he has named Connor Wigman the number one guy going into the spring. That has not typically been the case. Uh, in previous seasons. Did that catch your attention at all? And what do you think the benefit of that is? I think it's genius. I mean, look, there's there's no doubt he's the number one quarterback. He's I've said this a long time. I'm a huge Connor Wigman fan. I think he has a lot to prove this year, right? He's he uh I don't want to take that away. He's he's got to prove that he can stay healthy, um, that he can last 12 games. Uh but when you look at his body of work and what he's done when he's been out in the field, he's as good as I've ever seen put on a maroon and white uniform as a pure quarterback. The guy has some intangibles and the ability to make some plays that just not many guys can do at any level. And, you know, it's your team needs to have direction. You need to know, Hey, this is the guy we're going to get behind. He's our face. He's our leader. There's no controversy at the quarterback position. I love that. Now he's still got to go out and earn it and prove that he's the guy. I get that. Uh, but he's going to do that. In my opinion, um, I think the team needs to know that they can rally behind a guy. Um, and that he's earned that right. He's earned it on the field, yeah. most importantly. I think if he stays healthy, it's, he's a 3,000-yard passer with 30 touchdowns and probably no more than five or six interceptions based on what he's done. The th only thing I would disagree with Stephen here is that uh, I don't think he has to prove that he can stay healthy. I think that line has to prove they can keep him healthy because Stephen McGee <laughs> was one of the <laughs> toughest – I mean this. I wouldn't say this if it wasn't true just because he's on. Here's one of the toughest, hard-nosed – quarterbacks I've ever seen play at A&M and yet he would have missed multiple games behind the line and the way they were coached in the last few years yeah I mean you're exactly right there's a great Harbaugh quote uh, yesterday or day before at the combine um, you know every other position on the offensive side of the ball relies on the offensive line to be good but the offensive line doesn't need any of the other positions to be good, right? And so it does all start up front. you got to have a great offensive line. But you also got to put those guys in the position to succeed. Right. And at times last year, when we started adjusting the play calling to play with more tempo, to get the ball out of the quarterback's hands quicker, not taking those downfield throws, you saw this offensive line respond. We ran the ball well, or I say better, uh, later in the year. So it's – I don't want to just – 
parade on the, how terrible the offensive line is. I still have hope that they can be a good productive offensive line in the right system. You know, the coach is putting them in a, in a, in a position to succeed. Steven, what level of interest do you have in, in this spring football? And I think spring football is overrated except for the first spring a new staff comes in. So how interested are you in watching what Colin Klein is doing schematically and how much it might change from what he's done in his past at Kansas State? Look, I know a Tiger is not going to change his stripes, and especially a guy that has risen through the coaching ranks as fast as Klein has – He's obviously done that on the backs of some really solid schemes and some stuff he likes. But we've never seen him have control of an offense that has this much talent at his disposal. Do you think that within that we could see some different stuff from him than maybe we've seen in the past? It, yeah, certainly you probably could to, to some, you know, not, not great links, but tweaks here and there certainly. But you know, I thought the Kansas State quarterback last year has a lot of uh, similarities with Connor's game. Um, and you saw how productive he was. He had a great year. He did really good things under under Colin Klein. So uh, I, I'm excited to see what the offense does look like. You know, being a quarterback, spring football is always a big time of year. It's, you know, probably most advantageous for the quarterbacks because you get a lot of additional reps and reps help quarterbacks because only one guy plays. And so every time you get out in the field matters. Um you know, building depth. We saw the other guy step up in a big way last year at the backup position. But I think my biggest question mark is just the depth across the board, offensively and defensively. Going out against Oklahoma State last year left a bad taste in my mouth. And it wasn't that the guys didn't compete. I love that. They, I thought they did. It was just that when you looked out in the field, I thought that that was a football team that didn't look consistent with what we're used to in previous years as far as the depth of talent. And I know we had a mass exodus of transfers. You got a lot of new faces coming in. But ultimately, do we have the same level of ability and depth and talent that a Georgia has as an LSU? Because that's where the bar is. And don't forget, we got Texas coming into the league this year as well. So I want to see uh, all these new faces. What does the overall talent look like? I know we're used to A&M to having talent, but to me, when we turned on the tape against Oklahoma State, that wasn't a football team that I looked at and said, wow, that is a extremely talented football team. All right, Stephen, go enjoy those uh, mid-morning Paul Malls, and uh, we'll, we'll talk to you next week. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys. That'll be good. <laughs> That's former Texas A&M quarterback Stephen McGee. When we, when we come back, we will close out the go hour, and uh, we, I do want to get to this. I mean, Josh Pate is really hitting at this spring portal madness right. and, and doubling and tripling down on it. So real quickly on the other side of the break, we'll get Owen's thoughts on that. Uh, and we will roll right along on this Thursday edition of Tex Act Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
it was done. I like this song. Uh, um, I order a house like I said I would in a subdivided neighborhood. I like this song about the about uh, about uh, blame it on Texas. He's got. I hits. like. I'm just saying. I like He's that got one. Hits. He was. Uh, he once was named the newcomer of the year. I would. I would have thought about the brief time in my life where I thought I was going to get a tattoo. Yeah. The it was going to be blame it on Texas. Don't blame it on me. Okay. How ridiculous would that have been? Glad that would have been pretty I, ridiculous. I, 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 I decided against that, and so are, so is my mother, and probably so is my wife. All right, Ryan Broninger and Olin Buchanan wrapping up the go hour here on Texas Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. We are inside the Rollo Insurance Studio. Real quick, OB, got about two minutes. This spring portal stuff, your just thoughts on it. It, it appears that there is going to be a lot of movement to and from. And I, we're not going to get specifics with AM. AM might hold all their guys. <laughs> we don't know that. But it does stand to reason that. These guys coming out of spring football start seeing the writing on the wall, or maybe they mm-hmm. don't like a coaching change, or maybe their position coach is too hard on them. Whatever their reasoning is, there's another window that you have to navigate before setting your roster for the uh, subsequent fall. Yeah, and uh, you know I think college football did it to themselves. Why do you set up to transfer portal window? Well, the calendar is such a circus it's, it's right so now. It's so ridiculous. Up. Just get together and start figuring out, hey, this is the rule. But you're asking a, an organization who's never done that, right? never done anything with any foresight or sense, yes. to all of a sudden start doing it. Yes. So why are we surprised? Well, they got a new guy in charge, right? That, that guy who used to be the uh, – well, How many Matt, times have they changed leadership? Well, they had the worst ever the last, you know, with Emmert. He yeah. was the worst ever. Uh, I mean, guy did nothing except cash checks. So you got a guy in charge now. Get with your coaches and athletic directors. Say, hey, we got to figure this out. You're the guys that are uh, affected most by it. How do y'all think we should change it? And then take their recommendations and and uh, you know put in some rules. If, if he is, if the new what's his name Charlie Baker? If his, his name? yes, if if the leadership can change outcomes that quickly with an organization that's been so dysfunctional, that will be as an impressive of a feat. Uh, in college sports as I've ever I've you seen could have put a dead body in Mark Emmert's place and got the same production as you did with we Mark are Emmert. where we are in college sports right now because of the complete ineffectual leadership of the NCAA the, the domestic the, gov- the governing body failed to do what Anything. a governing body should do yes and now it's the wild west and no holds barred and I don't know how you undo any of this but Olin thanks for coming in see you tomorrow morning I'll be here. Okay. God that's willing. Olin Buchanan, Creek, that's rise. the Go Hour and Coffee Talk presented by Texax Coffee. When we come back, Texas A&M head baseball coach, Jim Schlossnagel.
All right, 9 o'clock hour on a Thursday morning. Ryan Bronger in the host chair. Tech Radio, we're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. Going right out to the hotline as we talk to Texas A&M head baseball coach Jim Schlossnagel. Aggies getting ready to host the Auburn Tigers this weekend in a pre-Easter three-game set. And all important, uh, as every SEC series, uh, an all important set against Auburn. Coach, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Hey, good morning, Ronnie. Thanks for uh, having me on. Well, Coach, at the end of the year, they don't ask you how. They just ask you how many. And uh, so yeah, another midweek win uh, and on a tough night to hit. And uh, you got some quality pitching performances. Just, I, I guess, before we look forward, let's look back at uh, the win over Houston Christian in the midweek. Uh, yeah, I thought Luke, Luke Jackson did a nice job getting us off to a good start. Um, we wanted to get Cortez uh, an opportunity to come in in the middle of an inning, um, and we did that. Uh, he only threw seven pitches. Uh, wanted to get Morton a couple innings. Um, he did okay, uh, but, you know, I think the more he's on the mound, the better he'll be. Uh, I mean, I thought from a pitching standpoint, until the last inning, uh, it went perfectly scripted. Um, Brock Peary's never been anything other than a strike thrower, so he just happened to have a rough night. Um, you know, the, we'll take the win. Um, I, I don't like giving up three runs without giving up a hit, uh, but that's that's that was out of character for what our pitching staff has been. Uh, and then offensively, on one hand, yes, you know, the north wind probably kept, oh, I know it kept Montgomery and Grahovic from having another homer, uh, but we also need to string together better, better at bats throughout the entire lineup. So the wind isn't going to be an issue this weekend. Uh, at least for the hitters, uh, you know, that, that thing's going to be flipped around. So, uh, yes, we'll take it and uh, keep moving forward. Hey, how much did Lucas Jackson help himself, not only with, you know, potentially grabbing a midweek starter role as you guys kind of look to mix and match your, your best options in the midweek, but also uh, potentially uh, being an arm out of the right handed arm out of the bullpen? Uh, you know, I mean, I think. I think well, he definitely didn't hurt himself. He threw strikes, um, threw a lot of fastballs. He didn't he didn't get pressed too much to have to throw, you know, an off speed pitch. Um, you know, the the midweek games are about to crank up, as you know, in a really big way when you have to go to Texas State and UTSA and until last weekend Houston was pitching as good as anybody in the Big Twelve. Um so yeah, I mean he helped himself. Uh, whether that puts him, you know, puts him in a, on the weekend roster just yet. I mean, if you put him on there, who comes off? Uh, so it's a, I mean, it's a tight ship to get on. But Luke, Luke, Luke did a nice job, and and those innings, as I, you know, as I told, I met with that group last week. I mean, but those innings allow us to be fresher on the weekend. So anything you can give us during the week allows the other guys to, to be ready to go in these SEC weekends, especially when we have another short turnaround from Tuesday to Thursday. How much did, did Chris try to pull your arm or twist your arm to go back out there after only throwing seven pitches? I know that was the plan to get him in in the, the middle of an inning, but I'm sure he wanted to get lathered up and get going. Uh, yeah, middle, yeah, middle. Max felt good about. It. We wanted him fresh um, because because of it. I mean, I think if we would have had Wednesday, Thursday off and played Friday, we would we would have let him go a little bit longer. Um, but you know, we, at some point we're going to have to find out if this the way he pitched in Florida is you know more of what we're going to see. Um, hopefully, the, the starters can get deep in games, but um, but Chris. Uh, over here changing moment down there in Florida. Uh, but no, he didn't He didn't say a word to me. I just said good job, and Isaac's in the game. Uh, and then Shane Sadeo's brief cameo had to be highly encouraging, not only for himself, but uh, you and Max Wiener, and then his confidence going forward. Yeah, I lost you for a second. But yeah, Shane did great. Um, Got to get his fastball down a little bit. Uh, but I thought he threw some really good breaking balls. Uh, their leadoff hitter Benjamin, uh, Sammy Benjamin. I've 
watched him play since he was in high school. He's a pretty good player, and he can definitely do damage. And I thought he threw some good breaking balls that, you know, Shane's going to have to need. He's going to need those. Uh, you know, against Auburn, they have uh, two for sure, uh, you know, I- Ike Irish and a kid named McMurray that can do big damage. And Shane, we're going to need Shane to help those guys out. When you look at Auburn, and it, just like with every other team in this league, it feels like, Coach, the number next to the left of their name in terms of ranking doesn't matter, and the numbers next to the right of their names in league play doesn't matter. So you can look at Auburn unranked and 1-5, in five, but that won't tell you nearly the story of this club. What do you like about what Coach Thompson's got going on in the Plains this year? Uh, they can – Really pitched. They have two really good lefties in the bullpen. They have an experienced closer. Uh, Butch Thompson's always been one of the best coaches in our profession, especially managing a pitching staff, even when he was an assistant uh, at Mississippi State. Uh, he really knows the SEC as much as anybody in our league. And then offensively, um, they're very dynamic. They have, they have one guy... They have a, I think he's a transfer leadoff hitter with 21 stolen bases. Um, there's three or four guys in the lineup that can really bunt. Like the bunt game for them is a very offensive weapon. It's not to, to give up out, it's to get hit, and they're good at it. Uh, and then you have Irish and McMurray, who left hand left handed hitters that can leave the ballpark at any time. And then one of my favorite players in the whole conference. Uh, Bobby Pierce, um, he uh, his batting average isn't, I'm sure, where he wants to be right now, but they still have him in the three-hole, or at least they did Tuesday night. And that means he's either swinging it well and having bad luck, or they just they continue to have a lot of confidence in him, as they should. So you can't assume anything in this conference. You look at what the sweeps, you know, South Carolina and Vanderbilt, Georgia and Alabama, I mean, if you don't play well, you're going to lose. And I always, I just truly believe that these games are so hard to win, but they're so easy to lose. So it's just, you, I mean, I, you've been around it. I mean, how, how would you explain it? It's just, you have to play well. If you don't play well, you're going to lose, period. End of story. You yeah. don't have better. And, and, and that's the toughest thing for most people. Like Brayden Montgomery's an outlier. Tommy White's an outlier. You know, there's a few outlier players, but other than that, you don't have better players than the other team. You don't. And Texas and Oklahoma, when they come in, they're not going to have better players than the other team. That can happen in some other leagues, but it doesn't happen in this league. It just doesn't happen. So you have to play the game better or you'll win. I mean, or you'll lose. Yeah, and I was looking at Auburn's numbers, Coach, and it – I love. I'm a big fan of Bobby Pierce, just like yourself. And his numbers will kind of make you made me think of Hunter Hines coming in last weekend, where Hunter Hines probably wasn't where he wanted to be offensively, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he kind of takes over their offense. Bobby Pierce can do much of the same for this Auburn team, and and really even uh, Chris Stanfield in left field. Like I think there's another level for him to go to. He was pretty good for them last year. Yeah, he's great. I mean, they're they're athletic. They can move. They can run. Um, they can hit the ball out of the ballpark. Bobby Pierce can throw from right field as good, you know, uh, with right with Braden Montgomery. Uh, he his arm is a weapon in the outfield that has to be recognized. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just it's more of the same, man. Um, th- th- there is no soft touch, in, or at least no soft touch in this league this year that we play. Well, and I want to talk a little bit, too, about just what you've seen over Caden Sorrell in the last week. And I think the maybe perhaps the biggest play of the game on Saturday against Mississippi State was the first play of the game that he made. And, Coach, that reminded me so much of the play Jordan Thompson made against Florida in the SEC tournament that kind of got Micah Dallas going in that start. And you guys ran away from the Gators on that day. But it's you just – You're asking me to describe this league. It's like you don't know when a game-changing play is going to happen. And like you always say, you don't know which run is going to win the game. So I thought Caden Sorrell starting the day with that play he made in left center not only settled him down, but settled a lot of the guys on the diamond down. 
Well, it settled me down, and <laughs> and certainly, you know, just just. Uh, but you're 100 percent right. You know that ball goes in the gap, and the mindset of a player uh, is so fragile, uh, especially inexperienced players. So, um, so yeah, it was an awesome play. Uh, then he had some great at bats, and then he made another great play late in the game. So um, it's just like you know, I, I uh, you know, I don't know if it was Nick Saban or some football coach. You know, that, you know, one play could can decide the game, just like baseball. One pitch can decide the game. You just don't know which one it's going to be, and that's why you got. That's why you have to play every single one of them. You know, with the wind, the way with the way the wind's going to be blowing this weekend. You're never going to be in or out of a game, ever. Uh, so, you know, there's not going to be there's, there's at times when some of our bigger, stronger hitters have come back to the dugout complaining about the north wind. And I can promise you, I've told them many times, all right, buddy, when this thing flips around like it will the back half of the season, then be ready to go because there's not going to be any excuse. So uh, free bases always matter on a field. And they're really going to matter this weekend because you can make a good pitch, and the ball can blow out of the ballpark. So uh, you're going to have to limit those free bases, and Auburn does a good job of that too. So it's going to be a really good matchup, Coach. I think when I one of the guys that hasn't gotten talked a lot about out of the bullpen so far this year and has been really good has been Brad Rudis. It seems like there's he's got a little bit of that swagger back that he had from his freshman campaign, although the arsenal looks very different. Yeah, Max. Uh, I mean, first you got to give credit to Brad. I mean, Brad. I mean, we were very honest with Brad. Like, if you, if something doesn't change, I don't see how you make this team. Uh, at the time in the fall, uh, of course, we love Brad as a human, and we love him as a teammate and an Aggie. Uh, but something had to change for him to make the team, and then even you know, and have a role, and he's. So you give him the credit first, and then Max came up with, you know, drop, dropping his arm even further down than we had in the past, and then being able to throw, you know, the breaking ball, being able to get the left-handed hitters out. That was that was one of the things we wanted to try and find out um, on Tuesday night was could he and and even uh, Peary get you know get the left-handed hitters out, and and Peary's done that done that well, done it well against our hitters and Brad. Brad really, he was awesome, man. He's very reliable, fields his position. He's going to stay in the strike zone. Uh, and now he has some legitimate weapons to get good hitters out, and that, which is what he, what he has to do in this league. So, um, yeah, he, he's gone from the from the outhouse to, I don't know about the penthouse, but he's on one of the upper floors, that's for sure. <laughs> Coach, last thing, we'll get you out of here. You know, so often in the game of baseball, you have to give up something to get something. And I just want to know, like, your reaction to Ali Camarillo's two-out bunt for a base hit with two outs and a runner at third. I'm a huge proponent of that play, especially when you have that in your locker, because there's no difference in that and you hitting a line drive through the box to score the run. But what that might do for future scouting reports may sneak a, a two-hop ground ball by a third baseman later in the year. Just I thought your reaction to that was so cool because it's a play that I really enjoy watching and that – when I coach my little summer ball stuff, I, I enjoy implementing as well. Yeah, well, I mean, we we call it the in your face bunt. Like if, if a guy's going to third base, is going to sit way back there, and the fun game is is a part of your, like you said, if that if that's in your toolbox and he's really good at it, um, then like you said, what it's there, it's a hit. It's just. It feels different when you make it out bunting versus swinging when it really shouldn't, especially for a guy like Camarillo. And so um, I gave it to him the other day. Who did we play? Mississippi State. And he bunted the ball a little hard and it ended up being an out. And then they made the pitching change Tuesday. And I told Mike when he went by him to go out to the, the first base coaching box, I said, you tell him he can score this run in any way he wants to do it. <laughs> and, of course, Ali Ali knew what I meant by that because some guys take that as, hey, you don't think I'm a good hitter, um, so you're making me fun. 
And I'm like, no, I'm doing it because you're a really good punter. <laughs> like this is a this is an easy run if you get the right pitch. And so, uh, and it, it's so deflating, right? I mean, it's only a one run play, but it's really a deflate a deflating play for the defense. The thing you said, the hundred percent right. There's a lot of things that I do as a coach, each of our team do during the course of a first four or five weeks of a season, just so that we can get it on a scouting report because then the up to honor it, right? And so if I'm playing like like this weekend, um, there's two or three guys on Auburn's team, they'll bump with two out. So we are gonna have to respect that, which which opens up your defense to other things that could be advantage to the offense. So it's just a cat and mouse game that good teams play. Hey, Coach, if you're near a radio, you might want to keep it tuned in here. On the other side of the break, we're going to talk to uh, Troy Clonch, talk to him about his journey uh, that he's had with the White Sox and then get his perspective uh, on, on your club this year. I'm sure you'll be interested to hear from Troy. Well, make sure you tell him that I'm and proud of him and uh, hope, he, hope we see him in the big league soon. All right, that's head coach Jim Schlossnagel getting getting ready uh, to host the Auburn Tigers on the hotline. And as I said, when we come back, former Texas A&M catcher, the original number 12 here in Aggieland for the baseball team, Troy Clonch joins us on the hotline. You're listening to Texas Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
Hey, welcome back to Tech Sags Radio. I'm Ryan Broninger filling in for David Nuno for the next couple of days. Continue the conversation about Aggie baseball. We go back out to the hotline and we welcome in, I guess now, Texas A&M legend and the original number 12 for Jim Schlossnagel. Former ca- catcher here, Troy Clonch. Troy, thanks for joining, uh, joining me, buddy. I know it's early in the morning out there in Arizona, but we appreciate you getting up and talking to us. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me on, man. So, I guess first, let's start. Let's talk about your journey since you've left A and M uh, in the White Sox organization, and uh, just what is the day in day out like for you right now, and and how have you gotten to where you uh, have really risen the ranks in terms of the organizations uh, where you stand with them? I feel like you're a really highly thought of guy amongst amongst that that organization there. Yeah, I mean, pro ball is definitely a, a different atmosphere. And um, I think that first summer for me after signing was a good adjustment period. Um, it was nice to come out here and then actually go out and play some affiliate ball. But um, again, last year for me, kind of an up and down roller coaster. I was, um, played at like four different levels. Uh, had to deal with about a month's worth of injury, which kind of sidelined me for a while. But yeah, I mean, um, made my way from low A to, to triple A for the last couple of weeks. So. Um, it's been it's been a different different world, like I said, a little bit of a ju- adjustment period, but I'm excited to kind of get this year rolling. We are in the last few days of spring training here, just kind of buying our time and waiting until they tell, tell us where we're going for the year. So I'm just anxious to get started. Yeah, and is there what's the biggest noticeable difference between minor league games and you know you played a ton of high end Division One college baseball? Is the game still the same, or have you noticed some different nuances that have really caught your attention? I think the way that the game is played is a little bit different. Um, the way that kind of pitchers approach things are a bit different. You know, you uh, it's a bit a bit more of a free swinging game here. So, I had to kind of learn how to sequence a little bit different as a catcher and call pitches a little bit differently. Um, you know, I think the the biggest thing that I miss about the college game is just the locker room and the boys. Like, you're with them all day, every day. Um, I miss, like, miss that fight to win every single night. I think with how monotonous the game of pro ball can get, um, you know, if you lose a couple games on a Wednesday and a Thursday, it's like, oh, it's okay, you know, we still got Friday, Saturday, Sunday to go. Um, That's something that I kind of miss about it is just the fight and the grind to win every single day. Yeah, I'm going to let you keep trying to cut a promo for – college baseball and it, it what you just said Troy <laughs> is is so true about you, you listen and I, I played it and you played it and the further you get away from it the more people you talk to nobody ever regrets playing college baseball would you say that's a true statement yeah 100 percent. there's there's no regret in it and that's why you know aside from you know A&M being A&M and how special that place was like I say that my fifth year of college baseball was, I wouldn't take it back for anything just because you get to play college baseball again. But, uh, you know, pro ball is good. It has, its, it has its good things about it. You know, you get to live your dream. This is, I'm in the position right now that, um, you know, four-year-old Troy was dreaming to be in. And that's something that I don't take for granted. But, uh, yeah, the college game is, is different, and it's a little bit more excitement behind it. How much do you still talk to the members of that 2022 team and, Man, I'm telling you, people still talk about y'all day in, day out at the ballpark. You walk around Bluebell Park, and everything that this current A&M team does is compared a lot to that 2022 team. So, you know, how often do you get to talk to Trevor and Cole and Polish and all those guys that really y'all cemented yourself in Aggie lore forever? Um, Do you still talk about – or you still talk to those guys daily? And then, you know, how often do these old memories get brought up in those conversations? Yeah, very frequently. Um, I mean – well, I live with Polish right now, so um, him and I are roommates out here in Arizona, so we uh, we can't escape each other. We're with each other 24-7, but, um, you know, a couple weeks ago, we went out to dinner with, with Willie and um, Detmer, Trevor, myself, and Polish, so that was good to catch up and reflect on some fond memories, and, you know, I, I talk to Cole Kaler pretty much every single day still. I talk to Dylan Rock every single day, um, Dylan being out in Florida. A little bit different but yeah we still we still talk um still watch all the games and reflect on our games so it's like i said you the bonds that you create in college and the friendships that you have they last a lifetime 
and when you chose to come to Texas A&M, um, and one of the big recruiting pitches I know was just the Aggie network and, and what you could do with that. So, you know, as, as a former player now that has lived through that, but only one year, what can you say about the validity of, of the Aggie network in terms of how it's impacted you since you've left and the connections you've made at A&M? I think it might have even been, up, like, understated um the the people that you run into um the people that still stay in contact with you that you met throughout your time there um it's no matter where you go feels like there's always an aggie somewhere and i uh i was in i was in the bullpen here backing up one of the big league games and i kind of like looked up and there was this lady and she was wearing an aggie ring (laughs) and just watching the game here in arizona and so it's it's everywhere and you stay connected and it's, it's incredible well, how connected have you stayed to this current A and M team? Obviously, super talented group, uh, off to a twenty-two and three start. Which I don't care who you're playing, Troy. You know that if you win twenty-two out of twenty-five, uh, you're doing something good. So, what have you what have you liked from what you've seen uh, of this twenty twenty-four edition of Aggie baseball? Yeah, I try to watch every single game I can. Um, I think the one thing that I've liked from an outside perspective um, is how close that team is. You know, they they really look like they play for each other. And um, I know that, you know, when things are going good, it's, it's really easy to to have fun. And, you know, they're having fun on Twitter and they're posting their fungal golf. And But I think something that, in my opinion, shows is they're, they look like they're just going to be like that all year long. And I think it's important for them, highs or lows, is to continue to be be those guys. And I think that's something that, they kind of fight for and um it's really what brings them together no matter what's going on they they have that bond they have that relationship and um they look i mean yeah there's a reason they have the record that they do well you know this every team has a different personality and you guys latched onto the pringles thing and y'all had y'all's own deal and then you know the 23 club had they were more stoic and and buttoned up and this team certainly had it's a very different i can tell you as as a guy that's covered the day in day out of this program for a long time, and especially since Schlosh has been here, this is a very different group. But one guy that has hung around that is wearing your old jersey and was a former teammate of yours is Ryan Targotch. Now, he's been sidelined with some injuries, and he's playing on a different roster, so his opportunities have been different than what they were in 2022. But how important is it to have a guy that's wearing that number and its influence in the locker room that has seen it all and done it all? Yeah, it's vital. I mean, Tar, there's a reason Tar wears that number. Um, and there's a reason that Tar is going to continue to be the guy that he is, whether or not he plays every day or plays sparingly. He's, that's just who he is as a human being. That's who he is as a teammate. Um, and he, you know, I, I think is a huge part of that team. Um, whether he's going to, you know, hit 30 home runs for him and be that big piece of it or not, it, it doesn't matter. Like, he is a key, key piece of that team. Well, and the guy that got behind the plate now playing in your spot, Jackson Appel, how much have you been able to watch of him? And, man, Troy, y'all might be the same age. If not, he may be one year younger than you. He's an <laughs> older guy back there. But I tell you what, Schloss has got a pretty good hit rate on, on grabbing you guys out of the portal behind the dish. Yeah, he's been impressive. It, uh, it doesn't look like much affects him, and I think that's something that's really important for a catcher. He's very flat-lined. That heart rate is very flat-lined, and uh, – I know that, you know, from my experience, that's something that's really important. And I think there's a reason that the pitching staff has been so good this year is because, you know, when, when you're looking forward and you're looking at Jackson and just his attitude and your demeanor, like it calms you down on the mound. And um, it also helps that he goes up there from both sides of the plate and swings it a little bit. Right. So it, uh, yeah, he's been great for them and it's been, it's been fun to watch him come in and kind of take over this team. I'll get you out of here on this one, Troy. What's the one thing you miss most about, College Station, it can be the 12th man or anything on the field, or it can be a restaurant here in town. What's one thing you miss about living here? <laughs> uh, there's a lot to miss. I don't know if I can narrow it down to one. I mean, obviously, being in the, being in that stadium, being in Olsen, all the fans, um, there, there's really nothing like it. And being in the locker room around all the coaches that every day, Coach Sloss, early Fox, Fox, everybody, um, those are the guys that I, I miss on a daily basis. and doesn't help when you can go over and get some Cooper's barbecue every once in a while too so I think I think my uh my physique and my waistline is appreciated being away from there but uh you know outside of that like I miss that place more than anything 
Troy, you're the best, buddy. I really appreciate your time. Good luck. I hope we don't see you in College Station for a long time because you're playing so much ball. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's always good talking to you. All right, that's former Texas A&M catcher Troy Clanch, one of the best human beings that I've come across in my time covering this team and also a really outstanding player as well. So uh, it was really interesting to get his perspective on this current Aggie baseball team and um, a guy that cemented himself as an Aggie legend in one season. And you know there may be some guys on this current roster on their way to doing that exact thing. When we come back, going to transition a little bit, going to go to the hardwood. We're going to talk to Aaron Torres of Fox Sports. So we got the Sweet 16 coming up. Need to get his thoughts on how the Aggies ended their run in the tournament. So we'll flip, go to basketball with Aaron Torres. When we come back, you're listening to Tex Ags Radio. We're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. All right, before we go out to the hotline, I want to remind you to put Callie Garner to work in the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Aggies gather at the Angry Elephant. Like your politics, love your bar. You can find an Angry Elephant near you in Bryan College Station, Magnolia, San Antonio, and Frisco, all throughout the state of Texas. So uh, put her to work. We are going to get some of your text messages read at the uh, final break or in the final segment of this 9 o'clock hour. But right now, we go out to the hotline. We welcome in a great friend of the program, Fox Sports National Radio host, best-selling author, and podcast host, Mr. Aaron Torres, who covers just about everything 
when it comes to college athletics, no. including March Madness. And AT, it's let me. I'll, I don't want to put words in your mouth. You describe the tournament so far. Yeah, I think this has been kind of like a hot button debate. I like when the teams that are good advance deep. You know, I mean, I am one of the few people that probably pays attention to regular season college basketball. Uh, and it's nice to know that, you know, my four or five months of paying attention and watching as much as I can, especially in February when kind of all the football stuff dies down, I, it's good to know that my time is, 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 is worth it. But I think more than that, it also means that we get really games uh, this weekend. I'll give you an example. You know, I live about 10 minutes from where the West Region will be played here in Los Angeles, but I feel like if I go to the games tonight and I was at all the media stuff yesterday, I'm going to miss a, a rematch of last year's national championship game, Utah, San Diego State, and then an Illinois, Iowa State game, which I think is as unpredictable as any game in this round. And so I just bring it up, Ronnie, because I know there are a lot of people that felt like, okay, there weren't a ton of upsets some of the better teams kind of were able to advance in dominant fashion last week. I like that it sets up a Sweet 16 and Elite 8 where we should have some really, really, really good matchups. And then, of course, next week in the Final Four, we should have some big brands that we're all familiar with. Talking to Aaron Torres here on Texas Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. A- AT, uh, again, don't want to put words in your mouth, but there were a lot of mixed sentiments here in College Station about the Aggie basketball season and whether you call it a success or not. But I'll tell you what, I think nationally, what Buzz Williams and his team did for their brand over the first two rounds of that NCAA tournament has to be viewed through a lens of being a positive for the program going forward. I'll tell you what, rather than putting words in my mouth, I'd be curious for the reaction because it was something I was thinking about is, you know, I remember talking to Nuno and, and, you know, listen, sometimes you put stuff out on social media and, you know, I think the, the perception would be that it would anger the fans, but I think that, you know, I try to always be in it before I put something out. I try to be in, in touch with how the fans feel. And I remember, you know, early to mid-February, I said, Texas A&M is the most confusing team in college basketball. This was after a second straight loss to Arkansas, loss to Vanderbilt. And as the fans agreed with me, it wasn't Torres has hot takes, Torres is uh, a hater or whatever. I think it was, wow, Torres is actually really paying attention to this thing. So I bring it up because, you know, the Aggies obviously win their final four or five games of the regular season. They beat Kentucky in the SEC tournament. They obviously fall to what uh, ended up being a really good Florida team. But then you obviously, again, uh, you guys know how it ended. I mean, you you destroy Nebraska, and you you take Houston, obviously, to overtime and down to the wire. So, you know, I would say the last, you know, three, four weeks of the season were what we were hoping it would be from November, December. But I think you could also argue that for a big stretch, uh, Texas A&M was as disappointing as any team in college basketball. So I'll be curious, as somebody who's in the belly of the beast, you guys talk about it every day, what has the reaction been to this season for Aggie basketball? Yeah, I certainly see both sides of the ledger there, Aaron, because if you don't go on the five-game losing streak in the middle of conference play, then you're not playing Houston in the second round. But on the flip side, you were able to bounce back, and like Buzz Williams' teams have done since he's been here, they continue to get better toward late February and into March. Enough. And you ended the season probably not where you wanted to. Like, if you would have told uh, an A&M fan back in late November when the Aggies were preseason number 15, and you would have said, look, you're going to lose a heartbreaker in overtime to a number one overall seed in round two, they would be going, well, how are we getting to play a, a, a number one seed in round two? I think we'll be better than that. But if we're in that scenario, I think we I'd be okay with it. So it, it's I understand it from both sides of the ledger, and I certainly understand that the A and M fan base is tired of so-called moral victories. But you have to be able to look at each thing independently and and, and call it for what it is. Like when A and M got into that scenario where they were going to be an eight or nine seed, then that was about as good of a performance as you could hope for. And all you have to do, at is hit a couple of first half free throws, and maybe we're talking about a A and M playing in a Sweet Sixteen, and you being upset that you're going to miss an A and M Sweet Sixteen game. No, it's a great point, and you know, but and I think, it, and that's what I think is the interesting conversation is, you know, is the, the you know you can look at it from from any which angle. You know, you can look at it as I, I think th- there was a tweet that I put out. I think it was after the second Arkansas loss. And I think it was 
you know, is five years, one NCAA tournament, and zero NCAA tournament wins what Texas A&M fans signed up for. And, of course, it's not what they signed up for when you get Buzz Williams. and certainly wasn't what I expected when Texas A&M hired Buzz Williams. And I put that out, assuming Texas A&M wasn't even going to the NCAA tournament. And so then you get there, you win a game, and to your point, Ronnie, if you're probably a seven seed versus a two seed, as opposed to an eight seed versus, uh, you know, one of the four best teams in the country all season long, you're probably playing in the second weekend the way that you were playing. And so that's where it's tough for me is because, you know, there was a big stretch where I didn't even think a was going to make the tournament. So is it a more, you know, is it a victory to say you got to the tournament and you won a game there? Or is it a disappointment that you had to rally late in the season to even put yourself in position to get to the NCAA tournament? So, you know, you, you said you didn't want to put words in my mouth. I, I don't know how to evaluate it because I think, I guess what I would say is I think next year's a big year, right? I, I know that there's some guys out of eligibility and some decisions that are going to be made like every team in the country, but I think you have to somehow build momentum off of this. This was supposed to be the peak, right? This was supposed to be the year it all lined up. And as you said, fifth, number 15 team in the preseason, are we going to get a two three seed, a three seed? Or are we going to win the SEC regular season? Blah, 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 blah. Well, you weren't able to do that. So now you have to figure out some way to build some momentum off of what was uh, largely, I guess you would probably call it, a disappointing totality of a season, a, a strong finish, a disappointing end. But I think you have to somehow build momentum off. But that can't be the peak of the Buzz Williams era is getting hot for two weeks in February after you thought you were missing the NCAA tournament. ATI hosted a week ago Thursday and prior to the, the tournament starting, and we were just kind of going through some of our tournament picks, making Final Four predictions, things like that. And I was very hesitant because I've been burned so many times by the Purdue Boilermakers to even put them into the second weekend. But now, as you've watched all of these first and second round games happen, can, can this be the year that Purdue breaks through? Because I think they've looked as well-rounded as anybody still playing. Yeah, you know, and this is why, Bronny, I'm always hesitant. People always ask me, you know, I'll put out a preseason Final Four or whatever, but you get into the season and it's, okay, what's your midseason Final Four? And it's like, I need to see a bracket because I was a little lower on Purdue than I think a lot of people, obviously. But I also, once I saw the bracket, I said, that's about as good of a draw as they could possibly get. And I said the day the bracket came out, I said there's only one team that can beat them in this region, and that's Tennessee if they're to face them in the Elite Eight. Uh, and we'll see if that happens. But, you know, listen, I think there were some people that thought Utah State could give them a game. I said Utah State's center is six foot eight, uh, and they have a seven footer who's about 180 pounds and, and shoots threes on the perimeter. I said that team is going to get destroyed by Purdue, and that's exactly what happened. Gonzaga played Purdue in the Maui Invitational earlier this year. Gonzaga's got to get a bunch of like mobile athletic bigs that like to shoot threes. Those aren't the guys that are going to slow down Zach Eady. So, I, you know, if you're lining up all the teams and saying, who do you think is most likely to win it? You know, I would have them in the short group, but probably, you know, four, five, six in that group. But, you, you know, this is the, the oldest cliche in the book. You don't have to beat all 68 teams in the tournament. You just got to beat the six teams that are put in front of you. And I really thought the matchup benefited as well. I think they, 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 they take care of Gonzaga tomorrow night. And then I think bluntly, um, I don't think Creighton can beat them. So if they don't get great, if they get Creighton, I think they're going to a final four and good for them. Um, but I think that's how a lot of the bracket is. You know, I just, I, I just, I look at, I, I look at, I, I just looked at how that bracket broke for them. I thought it was good. So to your question, Bronnie, yeah, I think they can get to that first final four, basically of the expanded NCAA tournament era. They haven't been since 1980. I'll say this really quick. I know we're probably short on time. That entire Midwest region, you know, Tennessee's never been to a Final Four. Creighton's never been to a Final Four. Purdue basically in, in all of our lifetimes hasn't been to a Final Four. And Gonzaga's obviously still pursuing that, that elusive first championship. So I think whoever gets out of that region, it's going to be a relative feel-good story. Uh, and we'll see how the rest of the bracket breaks. But I, as far as Purdue's concerned, I just as soon as I saw their bracket, I said, I have a tough time seeing them lose to pretty much anybody in this bracket unless maybe they get Tennessee in the Elite Eight. we got a few more minutes here, A.T., so let me ask you this. Oh, good. <clears throat> I thought I'm gonna rush. U of H was a team that if they got to the second weekend, they were going to be playing better basketball than anybody because down the stretch, just to me, they looked a little tired, a little heavy-legged, and they needed a break. 
Now they got to the second weekend. I think we're about to see the best version uh, of Kelvin Sampson's bunch that we've seen in, in about a month. Well, you know, the, the Jawan Roberts injury in the Big 12 tournament really hurt them. And so I haven't seen, you know, I think they'll have their media today. I don't know if there's an update, but you can tell in that a and game, especially by the end, he was really limping around pretty good. So my guess is anytime you can get that guy three days off, uh, I think that, that it's, um, you know, it's, it's a good deal. And I would also say this, too, is, again, it's a matchup-based tournament. And you look at Duke, I think they hit, like, 15 threes against James Madison. James Madison's kind of a team that wants to get up and down, uh, you know, try to try to out-athlete you. And it's like, well, Duke's got pretty good athletes, obviously. Um, but I don't know that Duke is ready for the war that's coming from them defensively for Houston. As a matter of fact, that's actually, like, my best bet of the weekend is, you know, I'm not giving gambling advice, but I'm just saying I think Houston – dominates that game. And so I think it's the combination of being able to get a little bit healthier, a little bit of time off to your point, Ronnie. But I also just, I, I, this is just such a matchup-based event, and I really do like the matchup for Houston. And frankly, I would obviously like the matchup for Houston, uh, independent of who they could potentially play in the elite, whether it be Marquette or in Yeah, AT, we don't want you giving any gambling advice out there in L.A. with no. an MLB opening day. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, man. And uh, of course, does have a $4.5 million line of credit. I can promise you that much. <laughs> AT, really appreciate the time, buddy. Enjoy the weekend. Ronnie, I'll love talking to you, man. Have a great weekend. Appreciate you. All right. That's Fox Sports News. Uh, Fox Sports News. Uh, Fox Sports uh, podcast host and Fox Sports personality Aaron Torres joins us on the radio show as he does every Thursday. When we come back, we're going to try to put Callie Garner to work a little bit. We haven't heard from her in a while. Probably by design because she's wearing that heinous Ranger shirt today. Uh, but no, we'll put, <laughs> we'll put Callie to work in the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. When we come back, your text and more. You're listening to Tex Ags Radio presented by David Garner's Jewelers.
But I'm telling you what, whoever is pulling the strings back at the mothership on these intro songs for the segments, I apologize, I don't know your name, but you're doing a great job with these. Uh, that would be our good friend Sean. Oh, back Sean, at thank the mothership. you. Thank you. That's uh, making me feel like I'm right back in Southeast Texas. It, these are all just hits from my childhood. Keep them rolling. We're going to do this all day. Beaumont 90s Country's music. If you don't like it, change the channel. This is Tech Sags Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. To close out this 9 o'clock hour, let's go over to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center where Callie Gardner is going to read, I think, some text and then has an update on Aggies in the MLB. Yeah, let's just go ahead and kick it off with the Aggies in the MLB really fast. On opening day rosters, we've got A.J. Minner, Bryce Miller, Brooks Raley, Ross Stripling, Michael Waka, and Stephen Kolek. What do you notice about all those guys? They all are pitchers. They're all pitchers mm -hmm. that does speak to the Rob Childress era because that, that's kind of what he did extremely well but maybe with uh you know once Jim Schlossnagel's program gets up and running in terms of producing uh minor league major league prospects maybe that shift starts to, to change where we see more position players certainly there's guys on the roster now that you would expect to uh, have a big league career as an everyday player um <laughs> most notably the first three in the order <laughs> yeah but, absolutely uh, yeah, no, that's really neat, though. Awesome awesome for them and really rooting for them as their season kicks off today. By the way, all those guys I've gotten to know, they are great dudes, mm -hmm. incredible human beings. Uh, Brooks Raley, is, uh, he's probably the oldest guy on there. He's a little bit younger than me, uh, and he, his career has been remarkable. I'd love to get Brooks on radio or do like a sit-down interview with him about his time in Major League Baseball, but also he spent so much of his career in Korea. And so living a, completely across the world from his family, um, he's got three girls and a boy. His wife, Rachel, played soccer here at A&M, and she seems like a total rock star uh, having to tote those kids around. Uh, you know, he's playing in New York City, so can yeah. you imagine being the, the wife of a, of a big leaguer and starting a family with your husband across the world? And then also now he's, you know, he played in Houston for a little bit. And now he's with the New York Mets, so braving the all that is New York City with, uh, I think they're probably four toddlers, I would say, like yeah. four kids under four or five years old. That's got to be crazy. So I, I would love to sit down with Brooks and Rachel at some point because their story is just incredible. What else you got? Yeah, we've got a text from PG Ag in King Oaks, and he says, the 22 baseball clubs seem to consciously run up pitch counts, and it paid big dividends as we ate into bullpens. Do you think we've gotten away from that a little bit in the last two years, and why? No, I think in 2023, they led the nation in walks. So I don't think they've gotten away from that at all. And right now, this current team coming into the SEC play, I th our intern Jackson was looking this up, and coming into SEC play, they were number two. Or, no, excuse me, they were tied – with South Carolina for most walks in the country. So I don't think this – it's got away from them at all. I think that's the identity of a Jim Schlossnagel and Michael Early offense, and that's one of the reasons – we've talked about this. One of the reasons that they strike out so much is because they hit with two strikes so often, and you get deep in counts. And their offensive philosophy, their number one tagged, number one pinned philosophy at the top of their board is swing at strikes, take balls. Really easy to, to say, extremely hard to do. But that is their creed and their motto. And so they are going to work a ton of walks. They're also going to strike out a lot because in order to strike out, you've got to get into two strike counts. So to me, I've always – people ask me, is, does, does this team strike out too much? Well, we'll see. Like if they quit walking and they keep striking out, then it's a problem. If they quit walking and keep striking out and they don't have – they don't slug – they don't hit the ball to the fence or over it, then it becomes a problem. Offensive baseball is only about run outputs. Like, that is how you win the game. You don't win the game because you get more hits than the other team. You don't win a, win a game because you uh, walk more than the other team. You've got to put runs across the plate. That's why timely hitting is much more important than a batting average uh, or any kind of offensive ratio that you could look at. It's all about timely hitting. But we, as the game has grown, we have a better understanding of where runs come from, and they come from getting on base than hitting doubles, extra base hits to drive guys in. So if those are your parameters for offensive baseball and how you produce run outputs, then you'd have to say that this A&M team does a good job of that. Would you like them to strike out less? Sure. I mean, there's not, a, there's not very many productive strikeouts. I mean, there's very rare scenarios where you're going to like, I'd rather him strike out than hit a ground ball. 
So you always put pressure on the defense if you're moving the baseball. But I'm not worried about this offense or run outputs until they give me a reason to. And as long as the walk numbers remain where they're at, and as long as they continue to slug at the level that they've slugged since Jim Schlossnagel and Mike Early have been here, I'm okay with it. When we come back, we'll go back to the basketball, back to the hardwood. Logan Lee on the phone. Uh, we'll talk about the ending of the Aggie basketball season and much more. You're listening to Texas Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. I mean, it's just quality, feel-good music. I'll never understand people that don't like 90s country. Callie, I know you're, this, these songs are older than you. They are. Uh, I like it, though. My brother, my brother is actually a big advocate for 90s country, and he always tries to show me as many 90s country songs as he and can. And he's so. an Astros fan. Yeah, yeah. Seems like your brother's the one that got all the sense. I think y'all would get along. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had him in class when I was coaching P.E., 
Him and Nick yes. Scorton. Yeah, yeah. Funny hey, enough. Yeah, they, they were friends back then. They still keep up a little bit. Good deal. Good deal. All right, we're going out to the hotline. This is Ryan Bronger in the host chair on TexAgs Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers inside the Rollo Insurance Studio, going out to the hotline to talk to a former Texas A&M basketball player, Logan Lee, to get his thoughts on uh, and kind of wrap up the Aggie basketball season for Buzz Williams and company. Luganate, thanks for joining us, buddy. What's happening, Bronny? How you doing? I'm good, man. So first thing I want to say is I don't want to get into specifics, and it's not anything major, but thought I just send your beautiful bride and your more athletic bride some well wishes from us here at Texax. Okay, cool. I absolutely will. I appreciate it. Yeah, she's the best, and uh, I mean, she definitely lowered the bar. Uh, I can't believe she did that, but now she's got to live with a lifelong of. <laughs> wow, you couldn't you couldn't just say like, hey, you're a good recruiter. I'm you kidding. do things well. You're a good shooter. Just straight, straight to lower in the bar. Yep, yep. You're a good shooter. She's a better one. I understand. Um. Anyway, so speaking of shooting, uh, I think whenever you look at the totality of the A and M basketball season, Logan, look, there's been a lot of kind of mixed emotions and mixed feelings on was this a successful basketball season for Texas A and M, and so. With that in mind, I'd like to get your thoughts on on how it ended and what we saw over the course of those uh, four months from from Buzz Williams and his bunch. You know, uh, I thought the season ended well. Obviously, uh, I, I wish it would have. I wish it would still be going, and we were still talking about games this coming weekend. But uh, at the end of the day, they ran into a the top team in the country. I think Houston's the best team in the country. Um, and, and they played well. They, they, they fought. If, if you go back and look at that game, that was a, a 40 minute fist fight. And, and it was a physical game. I thought, even though Houston had what four guys foul out and M had a couple guys foul out, even though there were fouls called, there were a lot of, a lot of contact that that were that were not called. It was just a it was just a battle, and a And M A and M did well. They they did the best that they could. I wish Wade Taylor could have hit a couple more shots. Uh, I wish they would have hit some more free throws. But at the end of the day, it, it's you look at them. They made the second round, which is an improvement from last season. Um, three weeks ago, we would have said. Yeah, give me a give me a win in the tournament. All of a sudden, we're we're ecstatic about that because three weeks ago, four weeks ago, no one was thinking A and M was even tournament bound, and and they turned it around like like a Buzz Williams team usually does, and and they made the most out of it. The season was a roller coaster, but heck, I'm I'm ecstatic about about how it actually ended and 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 them making the tournament and. Handling Nebraska was the way to handle Nebraska, and shoot, playing playing Houston the way that played Houston. Yeah, and I think in order for you to compete with Houston, you've got to be up for the fight. And one thing you can say about this Aggie basketball team that even in their lulls, even when the the quality of the basketball was ugly, they were always up for the fight. And that's like a that should be like a prerequisite for every competitive team at Texas A&M's campus, or really in college athletics in general, but not everybody has that. So with that in mind, Logan, how do they how do they keep that brand of basketball but also raise their quality so that they don't have these five-game lulls that put them in a position where they have to rally late in February to get into the tournament, and then you put yourself in a scenario where you're having to play a one seed in, in round two? I don't know. That That's a – that's an ex- excellent question. I mean, here, here's here's the thing. I, those those five game walls, those eight game walls, two seasons ago, uh, that's what cost them seeding in the tournament, which then put them in the position to have to play a a overly talented Penn State that that had a unanimous uh, All American on the team that had to play a number one Houston. Uh, I don't. I don't know the the formula to to not having these these types of of downward spirals with the team. Buzz Buzz has done a great job of bringing them out of those those lulls, but he's got to keep them out of it. And 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 whether that is the the staff's job or better recruiting, um, 
better better job evaluating in the portal. That's that's something that that the staff is going to have to talk about and do. I don't I don't I don't know the answer to that because I can tell you this much. I get just as frustrated as as any other Texas A and M basketball fan uh, when when those when those lulls happen. But the saving grace is every single year, Buzz has turned his team around and and they've been on an upward trajectory the, at the end of the season. So I got to ask you this then: What does next year's roster look like? Obviously, there's some guys that are out of, out of the eligibility, but there's still a chance for them to return a massive amount of their production from this season. Uh, and then I also want you to kind of give us uh, what you can on that group of freshmen that took their red shirts that some of those guys came in and we, we expected them to contribute uh, early in their careers. Now that was, I think that was probably a program decision to have uh, the majority of those guys take the year in red shirt, but can you speak to that class and how they may help? And then obviously the production returning, if they can get all those guys back. Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent point, Ronnie. Uh, Bryce Lindsey, the, the, the guy that I thought was going to, get some playing time, get some really good minutes in, in non-conference schedule, and then have some limited minutes in, in SEC play. Uh, just because he was a freshman, and, and even in the first practice that I watched him, you could see how good he's going to be, but his head was spinning. He just couldn't catch up. And I don't know if that continued, and that's why that's why he, was, he didn't play the rest of the season. Or if Buzz looked at it and said, you know what? He's not going to get as many minutes because of weight or because of boots, and and we want to save him and we want to to make his career as productive as possible. And to do that, let's give him a year to to just get acclimated to, to college lifestyle, college basketball, and grow from there. I'm really excited about him. Uh, I, I want him to to be the point guard of this team next season. I I like I like Rob Dockery, six six. Not as as good of a shooter as I thought he was going to be, but the kid is talented and he's long and he can rebound and he can play defense. You know, he's 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 a prototypical Buzz Williams recruit, and he let I mean he graduated early, and so he needed this year to grow and develop. And I'm excited to see where he's at. I I don't know. I I would expect there are going to be some roster changes. Uh, in regards to the transfer portal, I don't know who that would be. Heck, if you would have asked me halfway through the season, I would have told you, "Man, I, I'm I'm worried Manny's going to transfer because because you don't know you don't know what happened. Is it year three and he's playing four minutes a game? Sometimes he's not playing anything. And then now look at look at now. <laughs> I mean, he has he he rose to the occasion. He he showed up and he's he's a big reason, if not the reason, why A and M made the tournament at the end I, things are it, it, it's crazy how things switch so quickly right now but at the end of the day you got to remember it happens to everybody no matter if you're duke north carolina houston yukon well, whoever it is people are going to transfer in they're going to transfer out and we, we've got to watch for that i think you've got to watch for a big man you've got to watch for a shooter and, and that's that that that's who that's who Buzz and his staff need to bring in a guy that, that is just a knockdown three point shooter. That every time he he shoots an open shot, your hands are going in the air. You need a big man. I think if Bryce Lindsey stays and, and and he continues to develop, that's the point guard for for this team, and that's who's gonna that's gonna who's gonna lead the team. So they need a shooter and they need a big man. Well, the more you kept talking there, the more you kept eliminating my next questions. Because, <laughs> well, let's start with this. <laughs> We we saw the light really go on for Manny whenever he was thrust into this new role and probably allowed him a little bit more freedom to express his, himself on the basketball court athletically the way he wanted to. That being said, what is the next step now? If if this last month of the season, month plus, was the baseline of what Manny is going forward, where can his game grow from there? Manny's got to make. 500 to 753 a day, five days a week in the summertime. If he wants to be, if he wants to be great, he's going to do that seven days a week in the summertime. Uh, you, you, you see his athletic ability every time he gets on the court, driving to the basket. He has great body control. He's strong. He's physical. If he gets bumped, he can still finish. 
He's athletic enough to jump over people. But if he could add that extra dimension of making a three-point basket consistently, there are going to be very few people that can guard him. Because then, then you have to worry about his first step because he's got a quick first step. He's got a strong first step getting into the paint, rising up and dunking on somebody. And then he can knock down a shot. Like that's, that's tough to guard. There aren't, there aren't very many players these days that can, that can have that much versatility with that much athleticism at the same time. So if, if he's in the gym and he, he's making threes every single day and he's, he's expanding his range, that's where, that's where this team needs him. And that's where personally, individually for him to even think about playing at the next level, that's where he's got to grow. And when you say big, like they need to go out in the portal and find a big, how would you describe the necessary style of play from a big man in a Buzz Williams coach team? Because uh, he likes to go to from that you know six 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 eight six nine type of guy. He can play, you know, four of his five guys can be in that that range. But we have seen you know Wildens Levesque, a seven footer. Do you think you need like a big clogging guy, or would you think Buzz would prefer a six eleven guy with some mobility? and the ability to stretch the floor maybe offensively to pull a guy out of the lane so that the drivers like Manny and Wade can get to the rack easier? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I would guess that the staff is looking, they would rather see a 6'11 guy that's athletic, that can run the floor, that can maybe stretch the floor. But I, I, I do think that they realize they need a guy that has some type of back-to-the-basket presence. Um, so whether he's 6'11 and he has one move, and that is, I'm going to turn baseline and shoot over my my left shoulder every time. That's fine, as long as as long as that that player has that type of skill, that one skill. I think that enhances the A and M offense tremendously. If you look at it, the last four or five, maybe six games, they put Wilden's Levesque in the post. And he backed down once or twice a game. He tried to back down his defender once or twice a game. And that even, even just that small amount made the defense turn their head a little and question, okay, do I need to help? Do we need to dig in the post? Do we need that? What, what do we need to do? How do we need to change the defense? Imagine a guy that is 6'11", that can do that, I don't know, every 10th possession. That changes, that changes the way the defense has to scheme against A&M, and they can't focus on guys like Wade and Boots and Manny as much. And so they need, they need, they're going to probably want a 6'10", six, 6'11", six, six, athletic guy that can run the floor. But whoever that is, they need to have some type of post presence. We talked in the first hour about A&M football stuff and replacing Edron Cooper, and a lot of people get caught up, Logan, when they look at subsequent years after a guy has a really good year like how is A&M football going to replace Edron Cooper but what we know is that you don't you don't really replace a person on the court you're trying to replace production so that question I'm going to ask you is how do they replace the production of Boots Radford now that he's out of eligibility I I think it's just it's the same question of how do you replace a a Dexter Dennis Uh, how do you replace Alex Caruso, um, you don't do it with one person. You do it with a team. You find you find guys that can complement each other because you're not going to – I think we've learned this. You're not going to replace those guys. What they do is individual to themselves, and if you're looking for that exact model, you're never going to find it. So I think the way to replace it is in, increase Manny's role increase Manny's role and develop him as a player and then bring in another guy who who can do a little bit of everything, who can who can rebound, who who's gonna play defense, but really who who can put his head down and get to the bucket. You know, uh, if if you want to go the opposite direction, replace him by bringing in a shooter. Because if you bring in a shooter that has to st- that, that stretches the defense, all of a sudden Manny can can be that that Boots Radford type of player because he's al- he's already there with his physicality and taking it to the basket. You give him half a second more, half a step more to to get into the paint by stretching it with with a shooter, and all of a sudden you've got you've got a a Boots Radford replica to go along with a shooter on 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 the wing and 
and Wade at, at the top of the key. I mean, you don't replace them with, with individual players. You, you replace, you replace them in, in a team effort and, and you find guys that, that fit the roster that you're bringing in. It, it you're not going to replace Boots. He's, he's too much of a, of an anomaly when it comes to one of the best rebounders in the country or the best rebounder in the country that's under six foot two. I mean, that, that's going to be hard to replace. So you, you've got to do it by a team effort. Before we let you go, any thoughts, Logan, on this weekend coming up? By the time uh, Monday rolls around, we'll have a Final Four set. Uh, and is there anybody that really stands out to you as having an inside track maybe to a, a national championship based off what's remaining in the field? I, I think I think Houston does. So uh, I'm, I, I did two brackets this year. One is the emotional pick, the the fan side. You know, I, I, I had I had A and M winning it all because I thought they could. I mean, if they played the way the, the way they played against Nebraska, they could beat anybody in the country. Uh, I had in in my emotional bracket, I had Colgate beating Baylor. You know, because I can't I <laughs> I can't bring myself to to have Baylor winning any games. Uh, but in my rational bracket, I actually had Houston winning it all. I thought I thought A and M would get to Nebraska, and just how it played out, I thought it would be an absolute dogfight against Houston with them coming out on top, and that's that's what happened. And so I have Houston going all the way and winning it. So I, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with that, especially after watching the way they played A and M. They've they've got it done. Yeah, and you've got to be up for the fight to play Houston. And I don't know that there's anybody at least on this side of the bracket, that's going to be willing to go like the fist fight that it takes to beat those guys because of how they play defensively. And I think this little rest to get their legs back underneath them, Logan, I think we're going to see the best version of the Cougars that we've seen over the last few weeks uh, this coming weekend. That would be my prediction at least. Absolutely. I'm right there with you. All right, dude. Well, I appreciate you stopping in today. Uh, Really, you know, again, sending as heartfelt and well wishes to Katie uh, in, in you guys today. Again, I don't want to freak anybody out, but she's just an amazing person, and uh, the reason why you're not in studio is you need to be with her today. So that's number one priority. Absolutely. We appreciate it, man. Everything's going well. We are. We will be back home this weekend, and, man, I, 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 I appreciate all the well wishes, and keep us in your prayers. All right. Thank you. That's Logan Lee, former Texas A&M basketball player, um, as Dalton – Tries to distract me through the window. That's the first time. You know, I figured we would get multiple of those today, but that was the first one. So now that I've made a comment on it, I'm sure I'll get three or four more and perhaps even a call from Billy during the break. So, all right, a lot more to get to on the other side of the break. Got an open segment. We'll take your text uh, in the Angry Elephant News and Social Center. Then we got the fan show here coming up at the bottom of the hour. You're listening to Tex Ags Radio. We're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
All right, rolling along to the bottom of the hour, getting ready for the fan show here on Tech Zags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers inside the Rollo Insurance Studios. Got an open segment here, but first we need to uh, give away a car wash right now. Caller number one, we're going to give you a car wash from Aggieland Express Car Wash in South College Station off William D. Fitch and Greens Prairie. Aggie owned and operated with the friendliest staff and personal touch. They offer monthly memberships. I'm a member, but we'll give the first caller a free car wash right now on Aggieland Express Car wash in South College Station, 979-693-1150. You can get your car so dirty, it's scary. That was a Halloween read that's still uh still up. They did have a suite, like a it was like a drive through haunted house out there. I live over there. I do have a membership to Aggie Land Express Car Wash. I think the updated read says something about their new location that's uh, about to be open on that. Well, why Texas. don't you have it? Because you probably have that right in front of you there, Nicholas, I and I do not. I don't have it up. Because my sense, you can get your car so dirty, it's scary. But this Halloween, it's scary to clean your car. Thanks, Nuno. (laughs) Come on, man. Listen, just run that back in October when they do the haunted car wash thing. It's pretty sick. Here you go. I can give you the new read if you'd like. Go ahead. Right now, be caller number one, and we'll give you a free car wash from (laughs) Aggieland Express Car Wash in South College (laughs) Station off of William D. Fitch and Greens Prairie or the new location on Texas Avenue in College Station across from the shopping center with Planet Fitness and Ace Hardware. Nice, Nick. You're welcome. You started it all the way from the top. They yep. got double the uh, – they got more bang for their buck there uh, with those ag- ad reads at Aggie Land Express Car Wash. All right, to the Angry Elephant News and Social Center, Miss Callie Garner. Uh, Dave, and Ed- Dave in Edmond wants to know what your thoughts are on coaches that preach process over outcomes. I think those are smart coaches. Obviously, the outcomes are important, but you can't rely solely on <clears> – <throat> Excuse me, solely on outcomes in a game in the game of baseball that is so geared to failing and outcomes not being the most important thing. Because if you solely look at outcomes in the game of baseball, it will eat you alive. So you have to dive into where can I find the positivity on a predominantly negative outcome game. And when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about in the batter's box because that's your day to day, everyday players that have to deal with a game that's set up for failure and frustration. So you have to be about processes, right? Uh, And really, that's with every sport. But I think he's gearing this, the question specifically toward baseball. Like, if you walk up there, and let's just take Jace Lavalette's second game against Mississippi State last Friday, for example. So Jace walks up there, and he hits the ball 111 miles an hour, 108 miles an hour, and 104 miles an hour, and they're all outs. They're all out, so the outcome is negative. But all you can control as a hitter is getting in the box, swinging at the pitch you want to swing at, hitting it on the barrel. After you hit it hard and hit it on the barrel, there's nothing you can do. That's out of your control once the ball leaves the bat. So they hit the ball hard. They swung at the right pitch. They made their best move in the batter's box. All the stuff that they can control, they did right. And the outcome is still negative. It's hard to harp on outcomes as a coach when the processes were so good. So it's just like anything in life. Sometimes you do everything and right, everything right, and you're not rewarded for it. But you know that over time, if you continue to take the right steps and, and do the right processes and execute those to the best of your ability, that over time, the outcomes with enough sample size and with enough data will be in your favor. And that's what you're chasing here. That's what you're chasing in baseball is – Sure, immediate success is great. And every time that you hit a five-hop ground ball and it finds a hole and it goes down as a hit, you love that. But you know that's not sustainable. What's sustainable is swinging at strikes, hitting the ball hard, and letting the outcomes be determined once you do your process right and being able to live with those. Because over the sample size, over the, the long haul, that is where your success and better outcomes are going to uh, – where they're going to come from. Anything else, Kelly? Uh, yeah, we'll switch gears here. This is more of a comment, um, but Katie in College Station was talking about Elko from the beginning of our show today, and he said uh, Elko paying homage and acknowledging the other sports in college has always been a thing. He's a community guy. Elko is developing better partnerships throughout our university with all of the collegiate sports, and I think that's super true. Um, I was following him on Twitter, and he um, I know he wished luck to both of the men's and women's basketball teams on Twitter, and he was keeping up with the games because he was kind of – doing a little bit of a live tweet when we went into overtime. Um, so I just think it's super neat that we've got a coach that is open to 
uh, celebrating all coaches in sports. And yeah, and I think he's a fan of coaches. He's obviously a fan of uh, his fellow coaches within the athletic department. And I also think he's a fan of Texas A&M sports and getting to know Coach Elko the way that I did whenever he was here the first time as a defensive coordinator. It, it wasn't that was something that was very evident that he was paying attention to all the other things going on on campus along with, you know, coaching the defense and recruiting defensive prospects in the day-to-day that goes in that. So he's just, he's very well-rounded. Uh, I, I know he is a huge baseball fan. He was throughout the first pitch on opening night, but he's been at Olsen Field a, a few times after that by himself, just taking in a game. And so I think he's a fan of sports. He's a fan of watching coaches coach and coach Schlossnagel's has openly said he's the same way. Like I enjoy watching coaches coach and, and teams compete. And I think if you really a diehard in this thing in the coaching industry, you like to everything's copycatted. Like you're stealing stuff from everybody else, whether it be scheme, signals, whatever, ideas. All those are copycatted. But what I think real coaches that dive hard dive hard into this stuff like is like, okay, can I even if it's a cross-sport boundary, can, can Mike Elko take something from Jim Schlossnagel in his messaging that might help his football team? You know, can Buzz Williams take something from Joni Taylor or Trisha Ford or Pat Henry, Jared Chadwell? Like, I think there is some real appreciation for ideas in how to motivate your players, how to have a cohesive locker room, a cohesive message. Uh, there's... There's a lot of, not envy, but like there's a lot of want to learn how other coaches do that so that I can implement it maybe uh, in, in my locker room or in my clubhouse if I find something I like. So I, I think that is part of the equation for Mike Elko, along with him just being a fan of Texas A&M sports and wanting everybody in the athletic program to do well. And that was also something, Callie, that we had heard about Trev Alberts when he came in. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the, the things that the Nebraska folks had, were saying was that how, how much he liked to have a kind of a shared vision amongst the, the coaches of, of the sports and how they, he liked to have an open line of communication from coach to coach and how he, he thought that it was uh, for the betterment of the athletic department whenever Jim Schlossnagel could call Mike Elko about anything or vice versa, and wh whoever the coaches are, just having that open line of communication. I think, uh, I don't know if, if that was the case under the last athletic director or the last head football coach, I don't know, but it's something that I think will be emphasized now going forward. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, I think, you know, leadership starts at the top and I've seen a lot of interactions on Twitter between the student athletes and the football team tweeting about how awesome our baseball team is. And I think they kind of see their coach doing that and it like goes down into the locker room and they encourage the other student athletes here and it creates a sense of community that they probably wouldn't have without that. So that's super awesome. Too. You know, one thing I like that you said is that, you know, it starts at the top. So anything that you hear on this radio program that you do not like, do not email it to me, please contact Billy Lucci on the other side of the break. We had the fan show coming up uh, as we get you ready for Louis Bellina show starting at 11 o'clock. You're listening to Texas radio. We're presented by David Gardner's jewelers.
All right, 1035 on the zone. This is TexX Radio presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. I'm Ryan Broniger inside the Rollo Insurance Studios, and here is your weekly dose of maroon Kool-Aid. It's time for Let's the fan it. show presented by Gerard Constructions. Uh, custom home builders for the Brazos Valley since, ni- since 2002. They don't just build homes, Matt. <laughs> they, build they build relationships. relationships. Yes. They build relationships. There you go, Learn Kelly. more at gerard-construction.com. Got Matt Browning, Sutton Turner here. Uh, with us morning, today. Brownie. How you doing, Good buds? morning, man. I'm making it. I'm there making it. It's opening day. Aggie baseball's at the forefront of my mind. Big mm-hmm. series this weekend. They're all big in this league. Oh, they're all big. Uh, Auburn comes to town tonight. Started a three-game set. Got to talk to Coach Schlossnagel earlier. Troy Clonch was on. He is, is awesome. incredible. What mm-hmm. a what a you, you start thinking about guys that have made one-year impacts at yeah. Texas A&M across all sports. Yeah. Yeah. And where does Troy Clonch fit in that ring? Yeah, yeah. It, it's right toward the top. But we this is about y'all. Y'all's mm-hmm. opinions on what's going on. We'll start with what's on your mind. Uh, Sutton, kick us off. You got anything that's at, at the forefront of, of Aggie fandom right now? Yeah, so um, first of all, from an Aggie fan, absolutely love when you're on the radio. Oh. I'm serious. <laughs> I learned so much. I never played baseball. So I learned so much when you are on the radio. I love it. So with that being said, I want – you know, you've coached it, you've played it, now you're commentating on it. So, on uh, Tuesday night, runner on third base, two outs, that's the only runner that's on base. I think it was the fifth of the sixth inning. Ali Camarino uh, hits the suicide squeeze. And, I mean, Coach Schlossner, like, he was jumping around outside of, 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 you know, got up and was so excited. So explain that to me from a coach's standpoint on why he was so excited about that one play as a coach. Well, I think for, first of all, suicide squeeze is incorrect terminology for that play. Okay. That is a regular old drag bunt for a hit with two outs. A suicide squeeze implies that Ali has to bunt and that the runner is running on the pitch. Okay. So that is the definition of a suicide squeeze. You wouldn't do that with two outs. Okay. Because if you have to bunt the ball, which you do when the runner's running home, you could he could throw the ball out of the strike zone. You pop it up, whatever. Suicide means you've you've sacrificed a a, Right. With two outs, also, you could bunt the ball down on the ground, and the pitcher picks it up, throws you out of first base, they're out of the inning. Okay. So that is a regular old bunt for a hit with two outs and a runner at third. The reason why – Coach Schlossnagel got so fired up about it is because it's a weapon for Ali, and he only wants to use the bunt game as a weapon. And why is it a weapon? Because it drove in a run. Mm -hmm. There's no difference between that and him hitting a line drive up the middle. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the same difference, same outcome, right? But what Ali can do, because that's a weapon, now with a runner at third and two outs, where will the third baseman play from now on? Now that that's out on the scout. He's got to come up. He's got to come up. And now I can shoot the ball past him. Okay. It opens up the infield more. Oh, so okay. it, it's effective in the moment, but it's also effective down the line because it, what it does to the puts, scouting good, report. Put, put, put something on film that right. other teams have to worry about. Sure, so. absolutely. Yeah. All right, Matt, that's good. I'm glad you asked that because one of my fillers here whenever I got caught and needed a tap dance in case I have an open segment was breaking down some Aggie baseball base running stuff that they've yeah. been doing. So I, I appreciate you asking that. Yeah. Which is really cool. And, and, and uh, just real quick on Aggie baseball before I get to what's on my mind is that it's amazing that we've got Auburn tonight. Talk about this league. I mean, you look at the standings, they're last in, they're last in, in the South. And I mean, this is a – they're a juggernaut just like you everybody look, else You look is. up in June and they're in Omaha, you better not be yeah. surprised. No, yeah. no, yeah. Auburn's good. That's crazy. But I've got to talk about basketball. We haven't been here since 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 the tournament. Um, we, you know, uh, we were here last Thursday. And then, of course, we had the weekend of tournament games. And um, just want to talk about how – Look, there are no moral victories. I hate the idea of a moral victory, but man, some losses aren't as bad as others. I'll say that. So, you go in, you beat, you beat Nebraska the way that you, we should have beat them, and we did. We looked just like we should have looked, and then to get in there and play, in my opinion, the best team in college basketball this entire season. They were the number one overall seed for a reason. I don't. If they play the way they did, I don't see anybody beating them. Um, and and for it to boil down to something as simple as making free throws, free throws yeah. Dad, gummy that and and it, it wasn't just the free throws. It was also the worst time for Wade to have his one of his worst games. It was encouraging and enraging at the same time. Yes, yeah. it was yeah. just one of those yeah. deals where you're like, "Golly, come on!" I mean, I'm sitting there screaming at the TV, free throws, you know, and 
and then Wade to have his, his one of his worst games, but to have Boots and Manny play so well, and 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 it was just one of those deals that that you're sitting there, and then to watch them come back, you're talking about you're playing the best team in college basketball without Manny. I know they they lost two of their guys, but one of the guys they kept talking about was such a big loss that had done nothing. I mean, I think his stat line was one rebound. So you know, to for them to 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 you know going down the stretch, I'm talking not not in overtime where they lost a couple other guys, but I mean that team is really really good, and we battled and battled and fought back to tie that game. When Ag hit that shot, man, I'm jumping. I I shot mm-hmm. straight out of my chair, almost hit my head on the mm-hmm. ceiling. Uh, I, my I don't have ups like that anymore, but it was it felt like it. Right, I probably was a good two feet away, but it felt like it. I mean, I'm running around. It. I mean, like a kid. I. This, I want to love about basketball. I love that, that stuff. And and to hit that shot, to send it to overtime, to, with them in foul trouble. Yeah, you're and, like and, we're and gonna you, win this. We game. gave ourselves a chance. Yep. And and again, Houston showed why they're the best team in basketball. I mean, sometimes you just run up against a team that's better than you. And Houston is the best team I've seen, uh, in basketball in a long time. And yeah. I don't see anyone beating them. Now, it's a tournament. Anything could happen. But. It, as of right now, they'd be they, – they're, they're – the, I bet you they don't get – if they win the national championship, I bet you they don't get another game that was as tough as the one they just played. Well, yeah, you got to be up for the fight to, mm-hmm. to beat Houston. you got to have some spine and some yeah. backbone yeah. and some, some real metal yeah. to, to hang with what they mm-hmm. do. But for Sutton, I want to ask you this because I think because of the way the season ends, it has kind of split the fan base on was this a successful basketball season or not because of the way they played down the stretch and you also have to look at – that five game lull that really yeah. put them in that position to have to play a one seed in round two. Yeah, last time I was here, um, it was uh, we had four games left. I predicted that we'd go nine and nine in the conference, which we did. Did not predict that we would play as well against Ole Miss and the SEC championship, and and that the that Manny would continue uh, to play so well. Um, so no, I don't think that this was a successful season in year five. Um, for Buzz Williams based on the number of players that we had coming back. Um, however, um, I do believe that the program is headed in the right direction, um, but I wouldn't call this a successful season. Now, I think he's going to get some, um, some good uh, transfers in, um, better than uh, last year, um, that can contribute. And I think that he'll hold the team together because of the culture. And that the uh, and that the program is heading in the right direction, and so I I do feel like that it was a positive step, but not a successful season. Uh, I, so I, it's funny how it's funny it really is how how your mind will flip and flop throughout the season, right? Especially long seasons like basketball and baseball will do. You know, oh believe um, me, you should have read the message board after they lost to Florida on the road for oh, their first woo, loss of the season. Yeah. You yeah. thought, well, Schloss is the worst. Cancel the program. It's this. It's it's just it's it's amazing to me to sit there and look at that and go. I mean, three weeks ago we sat here at this very desk going, "Will A and even make the tournament?" And we all predicted no. Mm-hmm. And then for them to 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 go from from where we were in that lull to where we just ended up, I think if you'd have told me at that point, not only do we make the tournament, we win our first game and we push the number one seed into overtime. I'd say absolutely that's a successful season from where we were. Now, go back to the beginning of the season. If you tell me we win one game in the tournament and lose in the second round, I'd have been like, eh, that, that would have felt a little deflating. But as as I'm sitting here now, after everything we just went through, I look at it as a, as, at it as a success. It was well, not an embarrassment. We ended the season on a tough note. We ended the season with 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 our heads held high. We, we, we We're, we're going to be, you know, we we – I'm not embarrassed by by what our team did this year. Not now. Not with the end result. Not losing to 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 Houston the way we did. Winning winning against Nebraska. Hey, should we have been a different seed? Not had to play Houston the second. Yes, absolutely. We should have done different things. We should have beat Vanderbilt when we when we had a chance. We should not have been swept by Arkansas. These things shouldn't have happened. But where we are now, I'd say yes, it was. I think that I think too. What will happen is is that when you see a team. The guys that watch this, the, the, you know, the transfers, the guys that are going to be transfer portal guys this next season, they watch that. They saw what we sure. just did. The, we become a more attractive destination as opposed to a team that gets blown out by Penn State in the first round. Yeah, and if you, you know? look at that, so it, in the beginning of the the overtime, them hitting the three-pointer and Wade turning that ball over, that five points right there 
right there changed the outlook of because we come, we win that game, we come to Dallas. I had already told our family we're going to Dallas. I did too. Yeah, like I be there. I, like tonight or uh, tomorrow night, uh, I would have been in Dallas, whether it been the early game or the late game, and that would have been an incredible environment. And and I really think that given the t- given who we would play, I think we got a shot at, and that could have been a historic Aggie baseball. I mean ba- basketball season, but we were that close, and so. I look back on it, yeah, we, we, we were close, it, but the program is headed in the right direction, and that's what I'm excited about. Yeah, it's certainly, if you're looking at the season and trying to describe it, uh, up and down, I think, is fair, and then you'd have to say it with an encouraging ending. Yes. Now, with the production that is potentially returning, you never know in this day of the transfer portal, you're replacing Boots Radford, or his production at least, Right. Can they? I just had Logan Lee on. Yeah. Like, I think what they go do in the portal is going to be massively important to the success of next year's team. Yeah. <laughs> they got to go find a shooter and, and a big. And a big. Yeah. And a big. I mean, look what Houston, Houston, the, the, what's the kid's name that uh, kept hitting all the threes? Shed. Uh, uh, no, not Shed. Um, the, uh, uh, they had the, they had Shed and then they had the two, the two wing guys, uh, Stark. Or, what, I can't remember the other kid's name, but they were both transfers. They're both transfer portal guys who came in and, and gave I me. Mean, we're nailing threes, all that. So the the the, tra- the portal will be huge, and the portal is the key from here on out. Well, I mean, and, it and, is. And especially let's basketball. Face it, if if in fact Julius Marble can come back, that's huge for yeah, this team. Is. That is. is massive for this team. You put Julius Marble on this team this year, and it's a different team. It's a totally totally different team. And so I I think that he's a big factor, and I'm hoping that he's able to come back. Is Anderson Garcia as much of a, as enjoyable of a watch for you guys as fans as any Aggie basketball players you can remember? Now it's not as flashy as no. Wade. No. And it's not as flashy he, as AC Law or Chris Middleton. Uh, but man, what he's an artist. That it's that 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 lunch pail guy, right? Mm. That and, and I mean that's the that's the AM spirit right there. You know, yeah. that's what I mean, that's what we like. But I, w- I hate to say this, the almost more fun to watch is solo. <laughs> I love watching yeah. solo. That kid is all passion, but no, Anderson Garcia to to I mean he he got he they said today he's gonna be in, he's a, 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 a finalist. finalist for the defensive player of the year. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. I mean, the kid is just all over the place. He's always tipping balls out and for him to hit I love that he hit that three. I really do. I, I'm glad that anyone hit the three. Don't be wrong. Yeah. But for it to be him and for, I mean, just nothing but net. I mean, no doubter. Yeah. It was awesome. And I think him, he defines grit to me. Yeah. Um, and Aggies love grit. That's why you having Stephen McGee on earlier. I mean, that's why he is so infamous, so famous as it comes to being an Aggie legend because he had so much grit. And we're seeing that from Andy Garcia. And Aggies love players with grit. Troy, Troy Clunch, you had him on. What a gritty player he was here. That's why Aggies love that I mean, look type at of Leon player. O'Neal. Yeah, I always go back to Leon. Yeah. I love, Leon was Grit. the grittiest there was. He Was he the best safety we ever had? No, no but we loved Leon, you know? Yeah. So guys like that are, are awesome, and he, he, he's, he's in that category yeah. for sure. And they can get him back. And, again, you never know what these rosters are going to look like, but basketball, because the rosters are so small, it, like – the personnel are vitally important because mm-hmm. there's only what twelve guys on the yeah. roster. Yeah. What other sport at A and M is going to have that short of a roster, and with the portal, have that much ability to flip it if you need to? Yeah, you're right. hoping that you don't. When we come back, let's turn our attention to the diamond for this weekend. I got to talk to you guys because one of the things that I've been talking to these Aggie baseball players about in these NIL interviews is the impact of the fan base at Olson Field, Bluebell Park. It has been sensational. We'll see if you guys have been a part of that and how much y'all have invested into the success of Jim Schlossnagel's team. When we come back, close the show on Texas Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.
All right, rolling toward the end of the show here at Tex-Ags Radio, presented by David Gardner's Jewelers. Let's give away some pizza. It's time to end the day with Double Dave's. Call number 12 at 979-693-1150. We'll hook you up with your choice of a dozen pepperoni rolls or a large one-topping pizza from Double Dave's, serving Aggieland Beyond since 1984. Reliable in-house delivery, bringing piping hot goodness straight to your door. Just click DoubleDave's.com and your favorites are on the way. Matt Browning and Sutton Turner here as we – uh, conclude the fan show on this Thursday morning. And I wanted to get your guys' take on the atmospheres at Olsen Field because in, in Bluebell Park because I've been covering Aggie baseball eight, nine, ten years now. I have seen some really impressive crowds there. I've seen some really loud, cr- loud crowds there. I've never seen it with this consistency. And to me, it feels like the fan base when you're in the ballpark is taking ownership of the wins and losses now. Like they're trying to pull this team through how, how much baseball have you guys been in the stadium and watching? Would you echo those sentiments? Oh, yeah. I've, I've gone to half the games probably at least. Um, and from here on out, I mean, I plan on – I was there Tuesday. Uh, it was cold. Um, but the crowd for Houston Christian was awesome. Uh, and in it, um, you know, when uh, – to me, the best part of the, about this crowd is, like, when the pitcher came off on Saturday. Lamping, um, yeah. lamp, and, and And everybody – I mean, there was no you, – you didn't have to choreograph. I mean, everybody stood up. I mean, everybody was like, this guy deserves a standing elevation. This was awesome. So I think there's appreciation. It also echoes the need for us to have a bigger stadium. I mean, it just absolutely – we should have a so much of a bigger stadium because, let's face it, Saturday night it's go- and, and tomorrow night are going to be packed. They're going to absolutely be mm-hmm. packed. And so – and there's people that aren't able to come to the game because we don't have enough seats. And so that needs to change here at AM. This needs to be as, as w- similar to LSU's field. We need to be able to have that kind of atmosphere at Olsen Field. And there's been overflow. Like there's a lot of people standing in the old Aggie oh, Alley yeah. now mm-hmm. uh, across the street, across the, the parking lot, the rec center mat mm-hmm. upstairs. It's been All full. Ups- yeah, full. Like, these games have been a lot of fun to go to, interact with, and then this team's a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, I mean, the, the team definitely helps the – I mean, the team being so dadgum good and just so fun to watch. I mean, when you when you start a lineup with Grahovic, Lavalette, and, and, and right. Montgomery, I mean, my gosh, that's a that's a juggernaut. I mean, that's a murderer's row. I mean, there's not a weakness in that, that batting lineup anywhere. And the pitching, I'm not seeing many weaknesses there either. Starters are great. Bullpen's great. I mean, it, it's it's a fun team to watch, and we're really good. And Olsen has been – I've been to three games so far this year, and it's been packed every time. Well, they come out this weekend. I you know, think it's going to be fun. You know what also it, it adds gas to the 12th man? It's like when you had your interview with Jason Braden the other day, and both of those guys spent so much time talking about playing in front of the 12th man. And Braden, this is his first year. And they talk and talk and talk about the, the guzzlers that are out there with Braden uh, Montgomery and that are cheering him on. So when those players talk about that type of environment, how much they're enjoying it, 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 it like pours gas on the 12th man. And I do have to agree, too. I mean, we, I mean this is A&M. We should, have, we should have the best baseball facility in, in, in the SEC. You're speaking probably to the choir and Jim Schlossley yes. as the leader. I mean, oh, I know. He, I we, mean, it, and, and, but this is, this is why it's important. Everyone showing up and showing this place packs out has got to be – we've got to go ahead and get a new stadium. So Matt Sutton, thank you guys for you coming in. That's sir, Texas Radio. Job. Louis Bellina Show on the other side of the break. I'll be back in the chair tomorrow. We're presented by, Texas, uh, we're presented by David Gardner's Jewelers.